Good evening, folks. Thank you for being here. We are going to begin the planning board hearing for Northampton for Thursday, October 25th. Uh, we do have one item Can on the agenda. Can you speak a little louder, please? Sure. We do have one item on the agenda that is continued, but we always begin our meetings with public comment related to any item that is not on the agenda. So if anyone would like to make a comment, again, on something that is not on the agenda, uh, please come to the podium and state your name and your address. And if there is no comment, we'll move to our hearing that is a continuation of a request by Benjamin Lewis for site plan and special permit to demolish an existing office building and four family house in order to construct 12 townhouse units at 236 South Street slash 3 Olive Street, Northampton Map ID 38B-245 and 246. Uh, in terms of our process, we begin this part of the evening by hearing a presentation from the applicant. Because this is a continuation, the plans have been revised, so there are several things that are different from what we have seen in previous meetings here. So we ask that the applicant make a presentation, and then we'll open up the floor once again to public comment. So if there is a presentation, please come up and tell us all about it. Thank you. Good evening, thank you, um, members of the planning board. Uh, again, my name is Ben Lewis. I'm the developer working on this project over at 236 South Street and 3 Olive Street. Um, I'm only going to talk about the new material. I hope yes. that's okay. If you have you questions have or. Do you have a microphone you can use? Uh, I think that's just a recording mic, is that right? No, no, I'll try to speak up. Mic. Oh, okay. Um, <coughs> Okay. If you have questions about anything, either from, from the past, feel free to ask it. Um, I hope that you had time to review the changes that we've made since the last meeting. I, I won't go over them. I'll try and go over them quickly. Um, one of the first, the first item was that I uh, mentioned at the last meeting was the question about what would be happening with garbage and recycling. So as you can note here, and I'll show you a, it in uh, black and white drawings, but right here is an a fully enclosed garbage and recycling area with appropriate landscaping behind it um, to shield that. If you want to see it on, this is where This is where it is. Okay. Um, additionally, we shifted the parking lot 10 feet off the property line. Um, as I mentioned, at my, my expectation in the last meeting was that this was going to cause us to need to drop one of the units. At that point, we weren't sure if it was going to be one of the smaller ones or one of the larger ones. The site required us to drop one of the larger units. Um, and so what we did is we were able to accommodate putting one of the smaller units in that same spot, both to continue the streetscape on Olive and also to better allow us to accommodate parking <coughs> and this new uh, garbage and recycling center as part of our parking lot plan. Um, in the parking lot now, there are 19 spaces. That's uh, the 11 units would re would require 16 spaces 16. Uh, plus a handicap space, which we have and the handicap uh, shaded space next to it. Uh, in the end, we decided to really honor the neighborhood's concerns as well as the um, our expectations of what our future residents needs would be. And while we understand that we didn't need to put those spaces in, we had the spot for it, and so we chose to do that. So there will be three dedicated visitor spaces 
plus 16 spaces, which will be identified by unit, plus the handicap space, plus the striped space next to the handicap space. And then the additional question was about what about a turnaround? So you can still turn around in that shaded space next to the handicap, but we also added an additional spot to be a dedicated turnaround space. Uh, additional landscape, uh, this is, let me try and get to it. Additional landscaping was added around the perimeter of the property on the inside of the fence, again, to further screen the, the development from the neighborhood. Um, we heard in the last meeting, there was a, a question about what about most specifically the smaller units, which are, um, you know, pretty near to this abutters home. Uh, and so there's, uh, there's landscaping in there. Uh, and then the, the main other consideration was to try to add uh, bike parking. And so we have that right here. Uh, w which ideally uh, we were able to fit it under cover. So um, I'm sure that there will be some technical questions. I know that we received uh, a little bit of feedback from DPW. Um, so if you have questions about that, I'll, I will certainly welcome those, but I'm going to ask that you direct those to Jeff, which is far better able to, uh, Jeff Squire from Berkshire Design, far better able to answer those than, than I would. Um, thank you for your guidance and for your recommendations in this. As a result, I do feel that just as we saw with the Historical Commission, I feel like the development is, is a better project now than it was when we first brought it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to see the, you know, I, I realize now I, I didn't show the be a little helpful. I'm sorry. I also know in the last meeting, yeah, the new elevations would yeah, be. Yeah. So um, we have them from a few different perspectives. If you don't mind, I'll run through them, and then I'm happy to go back to any anyone's different okay. that anyone is interested in. So as you can see here, this is now the a small unit to look like the larger units um, on the end. This is the south, this is the corner elevation looking at it from the corner of South and Olive. This is a, a 3D rendering. Just trying to give people a minute or two to take a look at it. I apologize, we, were, we weren't able to, this tree in front of 242 South Street is no longer there, uh, but we weren't able to effectively Photoshop it out, so. Sorry about that. Um, in the last meeting, someone had asked to see a view from further down South Street, close, you know, more toward East Hampton. Um, and this is our project. It's a, it's a little bit distorted because of the perspective, but this is the best that we could do with regards to the perspective. Um, this is the view down from Olive looking toward South Street. Mm -hmm. This is directly looking into where the driveway will be. A few shots of the interior courtyard. This is the aforementioned uh, bike parking. This is a, a, a more accurate representation of the fence that we're actually planning to use. No, that's it. <clears throat> is that fence also for the dumpster enclosure or just the? Yeah, yeah everything will be made to match, yeah. We're, we're gonna, I, I haven't finalized the plans with them, but I've spoken at length with uh, Fitzgerald Fence um, <clears throat> over in Florence. And they said that they can, they're gonna build it to suit. So whatever we need to, they'll be able to do. Thank you. Sure. So we'll do it now. Could I ask one quick so, question while he's yeah. So all of those visuals show the uh, the carport structures with the solar panels. So are they consistent with how you're moving forward? Yes. You are going to be using those. Okay. 
So there were a couple of questions. Um, there were some questions from DPW about the drainage related to the carport um, and just some overall concerns about the carports themselves. So can you speak a little bit to that? Um, yeah, you want me, uh, Jeff Squire from the Berkshire Design Group. Um, do you want me to just respond to the carport issue specifically right now, or there's also, I mean, I know there's a, there's a list of DPW comments that came in, you know, late yesterday afternoon. Um, we've gone through most of them, and I can respond to, you know, to all of them if, if needed. What wasn't included in this list was sort of our response back to them. Um, so it, it gets a little lost. Um, <coughs> so if that's any benefit, I can do that. But I can also just speak directly to the carport I issue. Speaking of the carport and the tree protection, is that would be the the good starting point, so, the things, you know, yep. the things related to consistency with plans that that are sort of part and parcel of what we always require and what DPW always says. I don't think we need to spend Absolutely. a lot of time on that. So the issue with the carports, um, understandably, is that um, so we've got we've got backing up. We've got porous asphalt on the entire parking lot over portions of the parking lot. We're proposing uh, carports, which are you know, in in, in the images that are um, shown are what you would expect in a traditional carport with a lot wider, you know, wider opening that you drive into and then it narrows down. So effectively runoff would run into that strip between the fence and, and the car and the and the parking lot. Um, and and stormwater wise, calculation wise, um, those weren't picked up in the calculations because we didn't anticipate them at the time that the calculations were done. So that's that's where that discrepancy came. Um, we've talked with Doug McDonald and the, and the DPW about, you know, the ramifications of that and what some potential solutions are. Um, the two options that we presented were, one, um, we could certainly put a gutter on that lower edge and direct it back into the parking lot, fully recognizing that, that you know, the porous asphalt is there for a reason. Um, you could split it up with a gutter on each end. These are only four spaces, maybe five spaces. Um, so it's, it's, you know, 30 feet. Um, so it's not a terrible length, uh, terribly long length to, to conceptualize a gutter with two downspouts that directed it right back onto the parking lot. The other option that we presented, um, and though a little bit, um, you know, um, um, not standard, is tip the roof in the other direction. So you just you would drive in, and this, you know, that would dump everything to the center. There's some, you know, value in doing that because you know it's all contained. Um, snow melt, everything goes to the center and that can be managed effectively. So we presented those as two options. Um, so the, the stormwater report that we presented to DBW anticipated that all that water um, over the parking lot area would be directed back onto the parking lot. That's what those permits that that calculation show. Mm -hmm. These images show it going the other way. There's the potential to tip it all back in and have it go to the parking lot. So that would should effectively satisfy DPW's concern. Mm -hmm. I haven't talked to him any more about it after that discussion. So, and the carports were a new addition to this project. Um, you know, I think the initial plans didn't include them. <coughs> so, are are they a critical component of the project? That's a. Uh, I guess it's a question of how of how you view critical. Um, for us, it's it's about. We do live in New England. It's about providing a space for residents to have their car protected as best as we could. This was, you know, we didn't want to put up garages or anything like that. Um, we felt like carports were a, a viable option. Um, and, and I think that the merits of it outweigh the, the negatives. So I think the Question, did, did Jeff Squires just say there were four spaces in the carports? Do I? Looks to me like there's 12. There may be, well, there's in, in a single length of carport, I guess, is what I was referring to. So those individual coverings would encompass five spaces maximum, because that's what the requirement is. There are more spaces total if, that are under if, carport. If you look on this, it's, uh, if you look, can see here, it's one, two, three, four under one carport, one, two, three, four under one, one, two, three, four under this one. So that's 12. Right. But each roof only under covers one roof four spaces. Or right. each. Right. Yes. Yeah. So what, what I was referring to is that you, it would be conceivable that you could put a gutter on that for just four spaces with a couple of downspouts back onto the parking lot. <clears throat> Carolyn, can, can, I, can I ask about planting? You talked about the trees, Mr. Lewis. Um, 
Was there some reason you didn't provide for any trees in front of the buildings on South Street? There, there are four or five existing city street trees um, there now. They're pretty young. Um, they're not shown. They're shown on the existing conditions plan. They do show up on the plans. Um, they just planted them last year as part of the tree. Belt. They're very small symbols, mm -hmm. is why. But there are. That little circle is a tree. Yes. Um, so there are those trees. We could, you know, we've proposed plantings along the, you know, base of the foundation or at the <clears> edge <throat> of the porches. And um, we, we do have one on this. Uh, there's one on this, on right, this corner. The southeast corner and the southwest corner, both. And along that whole southerly edge, in fact. <clears throat> Can we go back to carports for a minute? Is that okay, Alan? Mm -hmm. I didn't know if you had a follow-up. Nope. Uh, just to, to try to kind of get some clarity or close the loop. And so, actually, Jeff, you could stay there, I think. Because um, so if the if the carports had gutters that would that would divert water, then they would be then would there be a change? Would you have to redo your stormwater calculations and resubmit for? I wouldn't think so. My, that would that's my you know my own personal opinion is that I, you know if if the idea is that the calculations need to reflect all of the stormwater all of the runoff coming off of that parking lot being contained on that parking lot then you know the, the concern was directing storm off stormwater off in a different direction than what we're doing. and I can appreciate that so if we can demonstrate that all the water is going back onto the parking lot and um, I would think that the stormwater calculations would you know would be what exactly what that shows. Um, I, I think that we'd probably want to look at that for a couple of reasons. One is, and maybe you can speak to this, Jeff, um, is there a difference in, you know, the porous um, asphalt is meant to collect, you know, dispersed mm -hmm. um, runoff. And is there an impact to having sort of direct discharge in, in certain locations? In terms of the wear and tear on the pavement, or the effective, the ability to, mm -hmm. you know, absorb the rainwater in those, you know, point sources mm -hmm. essentially at those point sources, is one. And then the other, um, can, how would the snow be handled when it slides off the carport in that direction and then just sort of piles up at the end? How would mm -hmm. that drainage get directed <clears throat> back onto the pavement? So that would be, I guess, to the latter question, that would be one of the concerns I could see coming up with the gutter scenario, is that the, that the snow melt would still run off. So I can appreciate that that may be a you know, valid concern. Rainwater, all of that runoff, how you would typically calculate it, I think would, would not show a net difference, but the consideration for snow runoff off that side does, you know. I think there's also a, a <coughs> maintenance issue around gutters mm -hmm. that with an absentee <coughs> landlord, they make it, they're underneath the trees that are going to remain. They may get clogged on a regular basis, and then the water would just puddle off onto the butter, too. So, um, And then so to the first question about potential clogging or what happens where that water, um, the way porous is intended to work is that you have a completely flat, you know, surface area. So we've graded this, you know, pretty flat. Um, and so if... You know, in the worst case scenario, and it and the the um, studies have demonstrated that even at 90 percent <clears throat> clogged, porous asphalt is still effective in in terms of infiltration and water quality. So even if it's 90 percent clogged, it still works. Um, but conceptually, if it was entirely clogged for that, you know, whatever that strip is, there's more than enough area during those intense storms to distribute that water to you know, locations that, you know, wouldn't have that same impact. I mean, you're talking about a, um, you know, a, a strip of water coming off a roof that's, you know, a couple of feet wide, maybe at most, a foot wide, whatever that is. I don't, I wouldn't see that as being a major impact to, you know, to the overall function of the, you know, even if that one foot strip for 30 feet or, you know, however many parking spaces, the overall area for the parking lot that porous um, you know, provides is, is more than ample. 
the, the, the porous paving requires a maintenance scheduled program. How is that going to be dealt with? So there's no, well, as, as what we submitted to DPW, and I don't have all of the details, but I know the major components are no sediment or salt, you know, no sand or salt because you don't want to clog it, um, and because of the infiltration, and that it needs to be <coughs> at least twice annually. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's really the big. So, Mark, I, I appreciate that because I think one of those things that the city can't monitor right. very well is right. the, mm -hmm. those kind of maintenance plans. So, I, you know, it's probably not a discussion for this place, but maybe there's in a development this large or a project where they have so much porous pavement or they have very large um, rain gardens that have to be maintained, maybe there's some fund that can be developed that pays for staff from the city or the DPW to monitor. Okay, we're not talking about any funds from a, uh, a developer. <laughs> so maybe in the budget, the city can figure out a way to really monitor because I know yeah. across town there's any number of situations like this where maintenance well, if this, isn't if, done. If this was a homeowners association, it would be built into that, yeah. those yeah. rules and regs. Here you've got, you've got ownership this and potential. So the, right. so the DPW does, so there's a little, there is some of that now, not for the <clears> old <throat> systems, you know, built 10 years ago and, and um, before that, um, except even in subdivisions there are requirements for maintenance. Now there's sort of, because we have a stormwater office, stormwater manager, we have um, built into uh -huh. the regulations a requirement mm -hmm. Um, and actually in the zoning, it requires that if you don't trigger a stormwater permit, which this project does not trigger a separate stormwater permit, um, you still need to record a, a maintenance and operations plan. And the DPW recommendations are, <coughs> board are to institute a condition that states that you have to show um, annually that you're meeting your maintenance requirements and it goes on the deed it's get it gets recorded with the deed um, and so now the off the stormwater office has you know they're set up for um, billing now uh -huh. and also overseeing those Great. maintenance contracts but that's the recommendation from the from DPW is to put that as a condition that they have to record an operations and maintenance plan so it goes on record okay. with the property and can the neighbors and can the neighbors if they are concerned about can they go and see that it is being, being done well there what happens is annually um, the property owner is required to submit proof uh -huh. that they have completed the maintenance and that, that it's functioning the way that it was designed and so if it's not so if if that's not happening, then there's a mechanism to, I mean, basically they'd be in sort of default of their permit. Um, and so the city then has a mechanism to say, look, you're not in compliance with your, your permit and you have to do. So it's not necessarily, um, an, so um, certainly anyone in the city can contact the DPW and find out if someone has submitted their annual maintenance or what their schedule is for submitting that. Mm -hmm. So they can find out that way. Got it. Just before we leave porous pavement, yeah. it's such a it's, a, it's a great idea. And I'm glad, you know, I'm glad more and more towns and cities and developers are looking at it. It, it counts the same as lawn when we come to calculate open space? It's separate. So in, the, so <laughs> there are two different, there are two different calculations. No, from a zoning perspective, um, this, the, the zoning ordinance has not been changed to allow a discount in, you know, the required pervious or impervious um, cover that's allowed. On the stormwater evaluation side, there, um, there's a value given to each type of surface. And so there's a different value from pavement, uh, you know, a more yep. impervious value for straight asphalt or mm -hmm. concrete than there is for grass. So you've got those on the two end of the two ends of the spectrum. And then porous pavement comes in sort of on that lower end. So but that's different in um, from what the zoning currently okay. says is that we still count it as um, <coughs> we, we don't count it as open space. Right. Yeah. Did I hear that this is correct that that um, with this kind of asphalt 
salt or sand cannot be used. Correct. Right, because it clogs. Right. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. But I mean, that's impossible. This is New England. What happens <laughs> when there's solid ice? There's, there's, you know, organic de-icers. Yeah, liquid de-icers. <clears throat> so. I think, we, I think one of the manufacturers, in fact, is, is on the plans and is part of the, the maintenance to that. So that's what the developer would intend to do over mm -hmm. the course of the winter? Mm -hmm. So just to go back to carports. Yes. Sorry, because mm -hmm. we kind of got away from carports. So DPW's comments do <coughs> say that the applicant must revise the plans and the drainage calculations as necessary so they're consistent with each other. Um, you know, so we've talked about kind of the stormwater, but just to go back to snow removal, does anybody else on the board have concerns or issues related to snow removal on the carports, or is there anything else that we need to be mindful of or should be bringing up? I mean, I defer to DPW mm -hmm. if, if they think it's, to me, tilting them the other way, while it would say it resolve the snow issue, it would look awkward. Weird. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so tilted the way you would, the, the way it's presented, uh, if DPW doesn't have an issue with it and, and they agree with Jeff's comments, then I'm, I'd be fine with that. No. Okay. <laughs> um, and then there are a couple of comments related to tree protection. Um, yep. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a number of comments. Um, let's see, where to begin? So I think the intent is, as we've you know explained all along, that um, you know the goal in all of this is to protect not only the adjacent trees on the neighbor's property, but also the large silver maple that's on this property. Um, doing so by you know again this asphalt parking lot where we don't need to provide a, a large excavation um, to install a, a, a parking lot that we're just building up effectively, um, and having moved. Um, you know, now the, the parking lot further away and, and the way the islands are shaped and such. Um, combined with the arborist reports, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, you know, the goal is to protect those trees. Um, we're going to do whatever we can to protect those trees. To conform to the requirements of the tree protection guidelines, which say you need a chain link fence around the perimeter of the entire root zone, critical root zone, is just not possible in this situation because we're doing work with them. That's part of you know what we've tried to present. So um, there's certainly going to be tree protection up there. I, we expect that um, is going to be you know monitored both by you know our firm but also from the city. I would imagine that there'd be you know visits prior to or you know during construction, et cetera, to ensure that they're so um, I'm we are more than happy to work through whatever those details entail, but at least in, in so far as the way it's worded in the, you know, in the comments, um, it's, you know, we can't meet those standards for those particular reasons because there's going to be a retaining wall that is under part of that drip line, but we're not excavating, we're building up. Um, and so, you know, these, these are all relatively new comments from, from the, you know, from DPW. Um, so again, just not having, you know, sufficient time to, you know, properly address those with them, but I think overall the the intent is, as we've hopefully demonstrated, is that the uh, is we're trying to protect those trees and you know are, are doing everything toward that end. Um, Can you talk about the difference between the the chain link fence and the snow fencing in kind of practical terms? You know, because um, it sounds like there maybe have been cases where we have had projects where snow fencing has been used as opposed sure. to chain link. So what's, what is triggering DPW's comment here that, that the snow fencing is unacceptable? Um, I think our plans call for snow fencing mm -hmm. just because I, yeah. I think the expectation would be that during construction you're going to have to move that during certain times and that's, you know, snow fencing, especially on a, you know, relatively small site and compared to a large commercial site. Um, so there, you know, the, the, the number of construction vehicles isn't going to be, you know, Ridiculous, and once that parking lot is established, you're not going to go beyond those boundaries. You can't because there's a retaining wall there. Um, so that there'd be some period where you'd have to move that fencing around a little bit to accommodate the construction. But once construction is done, the, that whole side of the property would be stabilized, and you know there, there'd be no way to get back there effectively. Um, so I think you know I, I think that was. Yeah. I think <clears throat> certainly any of the other trees, the hickory in the back, or the um, Chestnut, whatever it was, and some of the other trees along 
Um, South Street, if the standard requires, you know, chain link, I don't see an issue out there because <coughs> there isn't that kind of work going on out there. So just to f um, f answer the question from the arborist side, we, um, in previous um, uh, projects, the city has approved chain link fence, but the arborist has recommended, I mean, sorry, snow fence, but the arborist has, um, so the policy has changed. Basically, the city arborist feels that the snow fence does not keep um, vehicle construction equipment out um, as effectively as a chain link fence. However, there are situations where for at least a portion of a project, some equipment has to get in. So I think the way to address it, and I think it's in the arborist report, is saying that in some situations you put chain link fence and um, it, as if, um, you know, particularly if they can't get to the abutters' trees to wrap the trees, they're proposing to put chain link fence um, at the property line as, as sort of that barrier. I think the way to sort of uh, potentially solve that issue about tree protection is to have the uh, chain link fence in place for the critical root zone for the, in, for the entirety of the project that doesn't have to deal with or doesn't deal with the retaining wall and, and the issues that are happening right around the tree and have the have a certified arborist on hand when they start when they open up that tree protection area to do the work that's required within the root zone so um, and that's happened on many parts even city projects um, um, they have to move the fence uh, you know to get in for that work and then the fence goes back so that there isn't any um, accidental um, mm -hmm equipment or damage from equipment what is a snow fence just the orange plastic oh, fence. It's like a mesh like yeah. so just to kind of clarify then so it sounds like there's there's an opportunity to use the chain link fence in the majority of the site but it's possible to not use it where the retaining wall is is that what you're well i'm just suggesting that it could be installed and then at the time that they're going to go and work on the retaining wall mm -hmm. Um, the arborist is on site and overseeing that work to make sure that there isn't any damage done during the work so that protection is, uh, the fencing is removed just for that piece of the work, um, but otherwise it's in place because a lot of the work obviously would be the building construction and mm -hmm. you want to make sure the equipment is not near those trees during that. Could you just use the temporary panelized chain link fence so it, it comes in sections? So that you can move it. Yeah. So it's. I mean, that's. I think that's typical. Right. Um, so it's not. It's better than yeah. snow fence. It's not going to, you know, wilt over. And but it's movable. So when you need to get in and. But it's more permanent. Right. So it sounds like that's what, the direction that staff and DPW would. I think that's fine. Like I said, I think the reality is, you know, the, the first thing that would happen on this site would be, you know, after demolition would be construction of that parking lot and to raise the grade where it's needed. So once that, you know, to, to, to build that wall, it's only 18 inches high. So I would anticipate that, you know, from the inside, they're just going to scrape away the a little bit of topsoil, drop these, you know, the retaining wall in place. We've we replaced what was a modular retaining wall, you know, smaller blocks with, you know, sort of a larger block, effectively the same, same height, it doesn't excavate anymore, but it's a larger mass um, because concerns about curbing and, and that kind of stuff come up, um, the need for tire stops and, and whatever. So it's a substantial block, but it just, they'll get dropped in a row, it'll get backfilled, and then there is no more work on that side of the, on that side of the wall. We don't have, you know, there is no disturbance over there. Okay. So that is a condition then that, that mm -hmm. we can, we can add. Um, so there's more tree protection. Do you want to keep going on tree protection? Um, let's see. What, uh, <coughs> so there's a question about uh, topsoil being removed from grass areas. Yeah. And if that includes the critical root zone. Well, and that's again what I was just explaining about how you know to install that wall, they're going to need to you know at least scrape off six inches or so to put you know at least a stone bed so they can lay it down <laughs> where we are in that root zone um you know both the arborists and you know our we feel is the roots at that edge that outer edge are deeper than they are closer to the tree and they're and they're fine typically a finer root system we're far enough away um and we're not excavating down you know yeah and as so um but 
there would be an arborist on hand for there that portion. There could be an arborist on hand to, you know. So, I mean, that's that, that image in the lower right-hand corner is, you know, sort of indicative is what I was trying to explain is that it's, a, you know, where we are in that root system is um, for, the, for the minimum amount of, of excavation that we, we, we need to do. But an arborist would certainly be on site when we're doing that work. Mm -hmm. And then there's a question about a silver maple that is that's that that's just a leftover leader that was on the demolition plan. Okay. Yes. Yeah, there were a couple of notes. Of, there were a couple of typos here and there. Um, I guess to be expected. And then tree protection. But that does show up everywhere else. Yep. Um, on the southeastern corner of the property line, we're in a Butts Ravel. There's, there's no tree protection shown for that, and that's southeasterly corner. Um, we would certainly provide whatever tree protection is needed. So I mean, there may be a tree that got missed because it wasn't surveyed as I yeah I don't know. We'd have to just clarify. But I, again, the intent would certainly be to, to comply with whatever tree protection we need to. Okay. So there's the DPW's comments include several details that would just need to be updated on the plans. Um, And then there is a question about, you know, we kind of talked about carports a little bit already, but there is a question about the snow storage area, not just the carport snow, but the snow storage area and mm -hmm. its effects on the critical root zone. Um, so is there collection of runoff so contaminants will not impact the root systems of the trees? Well, so, um, you know, the way the roofs are pitched on the carports currently, they would shed to that 10 foot or wider strip along the property line. Um, there would be no, you know, that would just be natural snow melt. There would be no, it wouldn't, wouldn't you know, have, have, have an opportunity to pick up anything. So that would just be, you know, um, snow melt. Um, the snow storage area that we're calling out for, again, this, the parking lot isn't intended to have any, you know, salts or, or sediment anyway, or, or sand anyway. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, you know, I'm not sure what the concern is. Concern. Yeah, I mean, again, yeah, we we're just seeing these two from DPW. I, so, so right, I yeah. I understand there's a lot of red. Um, it's you know, it's but some of these are a lot of you know comments like that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> to respond to all of them, but I'm happy to go through them. Um, <clears throat> Eighteen years we have a crew root zone. So yeah, I mean, there's a question about the you know. A note regarding raising the final grade approximately 12 inches. That's just a general note on the demolition plan mm -hmm. referring to how those can be protected. Right. As I noted before, we are proposing some work within the critical root zone um, as it's defined. And, you know, we've presented ways in which we're going to mitigate that, including the arborist being on site. Um, so I think a lot of that gets answers a few of these questions anyway or comments. There is um, a question about how, if roots are encountered, yep. how they'll be managed. So, yeah, to the extent yeah, they it's going to be just, updated. You know, the, the expectation would be that no, you know, no major roots are cut, and if you know a post needs to get moved or something gets needs to get relocated, then that's what needs to happen. And L five, there's in the planting detail, there's um, reference to a we wire can, basket. Yep, we can <clears throat> take that off, and there was a request um, to not fertilize trees the time of planting that's, that's again so that as a landscape architect I would <laughs> question that but I will <laughs> do whatever we need yep. to do <laughs> so this actual seed L5 gets revised to note that in text that those two things happen yeah. yes yeah so I think in general um, the you know a lot of these comments relate to just cleaning up the plan sheets and making sure that each plan sheet is consistent with the other plan sheets and that details are incorporated where they have been left off or if, de if um, specs in the details um, vary from sheet to sheet that that all be cleaned up and submitted prior to any work starting on the, on the site so that we can review final plans and make sure <coughs> all the right comments are in the right place in one document. Um, and that was one of DPW's um, primary recommend, um, recommendations mm -hmm. is that they see those final plan sheets with all those corrections. So would that be done at, at staff level? Or would we can it do have that to come staff, back in front of us? Uh, no, we could do that at staff level because it's really just 
the nitty gritty details, you know, you say four inches on this side, it needs to be six inches and it says six over here, make it six or whatever, you know, the comment was. So that's pretty much an administrative review, I think. And just one last clarification with reference to um, the, the deep root zone, or excuse me, the deep root liquid fertilizer and the root zone on the, for the sugar maples at 11 olive, yep. um, that that, you know, that that would obviously be done by a certified professional. That would get reflected, right. And that would be reflected in the, in the plan. Yep. Yeah, and I think, I think, you know, the overall goal with these, because a lot of it is that, sort of as Carolyn pointed out, the nitty gritty is just to go through this and understand really what all of these mean and how to get through them. But as most of it's, you know, as a chain link or is it snow fencing or those kind of details that we, you know, we can certainly work through right. and expect to work through. So out of all of those, the biggest one is the calculation about the, the runoff from the carport panels. That, that has to still go through EPW and W panel. You get kind of an okay, right? Well, yeah. well, I think, and there's also the snow issue. Actually, I had it. That's interesting you raised that because I did <laughs> just make a note. I wondered if you'd thought about, you know, you see some carports, particularly ones with PV arrays that are V-shaped, mm -hmm. and so the drainage goes in the, in the center, and that way that would prevent the snow from shedding off to one side and then you wouldn't have to deal with it. Have you thought about that kind of um, setup? Well, that's that's good when you have two head end parking spaces, you know, oh. nose to nose, and they yeah, both pitch right. in toward that center aisle. It doesn't really work with a single array because there's nowhere to divide it, you know, to make that split, that hinge. You know, the one the one other thought that I had, uh, I didn't talk about it, is that the potential to make the last 18 inches or so that carport the way it is now that roof, you know, um, uh, uh, transparent. You know, have something there that's not just roof that, you know, maybe you get some snow on the front of your car, but that runoff or something could come down onto the parking lot, bef you know, before the edge. Because right now that drip line is effectively where that retaining wall is. Mm -hmm. And so if you back that off, you know, that roof, that solid roof covering a couple of feet, maybe the hoods get some snow on them or something, but, you know, that's, that's where everything would go. And I don't know if that's, you know, but the idea would be to keep, you know, to, to make them function and look like carports, um, but certainly we want to address, you know, the, the, the runoff to the extent that we need to. So yeah. the intent is to keep them on the parking lot. Um, we talked about maintenance, a maintenance plan for the, for the porous pavement. There's been so much talk about trees. Should there or can there be a condition for a maintenance plan even short term for the trees that they should be reviewed whatever every six months or every summer or it, it says that no fertilization should be used at the time of tree planting which seems odd but um, if there are recommendations you know during construction and then would there be recommendations post construction for a certain amount of time is that have we done something like that before um I don't recall anything like that. I guess I would defer to the arborist. In, in, in the arborist in the report did note, you know, this sort of follow up with fertilization um, for the off site trees. Um, but I, I don't know enough about how to handle post construction. Or just um, like a. a, a How about a final? An, like you, know, you finish you finish the construction, and you know before before the final permit, one of the is are the did the trees make it through the construction? What happens is a lot of times with the mature trees, you don't see something for two years, and then all of a sudden the the leaf, it doesn't leaf out like it used to, and then and so I don't know if 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 that can be picked up by another <laughs> on an annual report. Maybe that. He comes, does an annual report. You're good, mm -hmm. and that's it. And that's part of the maintenance plan, or, or. I think the I I think that's a um, an interesting idea. I think from what I understand, the difficulty was with that is there are so many other stressors in um, the environment that it would be hard to know what's causing the decline necessarily. You know, two or three years out, or even, you know, if there's no 
if there's not full leaf out one year, right. it might be right. due to something Extreme that's beyond, yeah. you know, the construction. <coughs> so I, I, I don't know how you definitively create a condition or then, you know, what happens if the evaluation comes back that full foliage didn't occur this year? You know, what does that mean? Then what's the next step? Let's, so I think yeah, in order to have a condition, you need to have very discreet and defined. Um, also, once yeah. there's a CO, how, how right. could it be enforced? Well, it would be right. like the maintenance for the porous paving. Once the, you have a CO, you still have to do that. And if a tree, as Carolyn says, if it declines, it, it could be a drought, could be too much water, it could be bugs. I, I agree. I'm yeah. just thinking yeah. maybe it's uh, just the report would be the maintenance, you know, that, that an arborist come and do a report once a year. And if that report says, hey, it didn't leaf out like it did, the year before, I recommend A, B, and C. You know, at least, at least, at least, there's a proactive, you know, effort. No. This doesn't seem practical. <coughs> I think the other piece yeah. is that your evaluation would be so you ask for an, a third-party arborist to look at the plan <coughs> and make recommendations, and also to assess what the impact would be. Mm -hmm. So I think you take that information and evaluate it and determine does that is this you know um, you know do you accept that certified right. arborist report and if so then and in this case the arborist made recommendations but also said that with those changes in the plans there wouldn't be a deleterious of impact right. to the trees so I think that's where your jurisdiction probably stops in terms because mm -hmm. I think you're accepting that professional right. evaluation of um, what the impact would be. Right. And um, by creating a condition, you're sort of, it, it would appear that you're saying, well, maybe there's a question in that report. So if you don't, if you're still having concerns about it, that's fine. Um, but I think yeah. it would be hard to create a condition to address any concerns. So I think, um, and other than, you know, shifting things around on the, mm -hmm. on the site even further. Right. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, and I, there is a condition on all the new plantings that right. they have to right. survive one right. year or two years. That's, and right. that's pretty straightforward. Well, forever, actually. I mean, the site plan is approved. You have to maintain those plantings uh -huh. for the life of the project. So it seems like it's probably, unless there are other technical questions from the board, a good time for us to take more public comment. Yes? Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. So we will open the floor to public comment. Um, I will remind folks that, you know, this is a continuation of a hearing, so there are several issues that were raised that related to previous versions of this plan. So we would ask that you, if you are coming up to make comment, um, please make sure your comments are specifically related to the current version of the plan that <coughs> is in front of us. Um, and if you would, please state your name and your address. Uh, and we do ask that comment be directed to the board, uh, and then we may ask for clarification from the applicant, but um, this is a conversation between you and the board. Hi. Hello. Eric Kay, I live at 206 South Street, which is two blocks from uh, Olive Street. And um, I'd like to address the issue of setbacks, which are covered in the um, URB code. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk about is the rear setback. The um, DPW has deemed this to be three Olive Street, and I think that means that the rear property line is the south line, which is um, <coughs> well, the one that's <coughs> street. And I noticed on the Mm -hmm. And plan that um, that's only set at um, 15 feet, but it should be 20 feet. And I noticed that um, some of the building is within that setback. So that's my first, the first thing I'd like to say. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very directly from the, the code. Um, the other, the other thing that the code talks about, and I'm talking about. It's 305-2019, um, section C, 1D, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this one. And it says, front facades shall have setbacks consistent with other buildings within the block. 
uh, it's, and there are a few other things. Um, then the 350 attachment seven, which states new homes should consist of units that maintain orientation, rhythm, setback pattern, and uh, street frontage green patterns of the surrounding block face. And in the third place, um, 350.20.19C7, which says in part, the site will function harmoniously with neighboring houses. And it goes on to speak of landscaping, drainage, sight lines, building orientation, massing, egress, and setback. So three times in the uh, code, the URB uh, code, and also within the special permit part of that code, it speaks of the setback. So I went and I measured all the houses around it to find out how far they were set back. And um, so, let's see. Um, so 226, which is two houses to the north, is 62 feet back from the curb. Now the curb is 25 feet from the property line, but I don't have, I, the only thing I can measure was from the curb. So you can take that as it, as it is. Um, and as a reference, this project is 35 feet from the curb. So um, the next house I measured was uh, 228. That's 64 feet back from the curb, almost 30 feet further than this house. This, this project is, is trying to be built. The existing building itself is uh, actually has a articulated facade, but part of it is um, 54 feet and part of it is 61 feet from the curb, as opposed to this project of 35 feet, again, between 25 and 30 feet different. The next house is 64 feet from the curb, and the house beyond that is 50 feet from the curb. So I feel that um, on, on the South Street side, it's not consistent with the requirements of the code. Um, on Olive Street, um, there's the same problem. Um, the building itself is 43 feet from the curb. The um, small commercial building that's being taken down is 21 feet from the curb. The next house, which is 11, is 43 feet from the curb. The next house is 26 feet from the curb. And the next house is, uh, I think, 17 or 18 feet. I'm not sure. No, 21 feet. But those two, anyway. And, and this is projected to be about 17 feet from the curb. That's, you know, obviously it's 10 feet from the property line. But property line is on that side is right near the road, just next to the, um, to the sidewalk. So it means that this structure is actually, so as I said, it's between 21 and 27 feet closer on the, um, to the sidewalk on the South Street side and uh, about 10 feet on the av for the average of, of Olive Street. Um, so what I'm submitting here is that this has ignored the code almost entirely uh, from that point of view. And um, for it to be consistent with other buildings in the block, it would really need to be set at that line or within that, within that average line. Um, so I guess my recommendation is that it, as it stands, it should just be rejected and it should be sent back to the architects to kind of meet those code requirements. Um, there are other things, and I'm not sure if other people want to speak about them, but there is a question of uh, the massing of this is not consistent with the other properties. Mm -hmm. um, the rhythm of the buildings is not consistent because it's like, it's it's very clear as you go down the street that there's a certain form and then all of a sudden there's this large kind of shocking um, what the Historic Commission called a fortress-like building. Um, I, that's all I have to say. Could, could, excuse me, could I ask <clears throat> uh, Eric, um, yes. what code were you referring to that requires that it be consistent in the setback? It's um, what's called three, uh, I'll read you the title again, it's I think it's 350.20-19. That's the part of the that, zoning ordinance. Um, does of, anybody? 
I, I'm not an I, I'm not a lawyer, but I found it um, on the town website. I think it's what's called it's the what URB zoning. For a special what, permit. what do you call it? The requirements for a special permit in the URB zone. Well, that's one Make of them. The that's the that's the three fifty dash seven. Is is the uh, is the requirements for the special permit? That's the um, the dimensions, measurements, and stuff um, that are published. And then the other one is the is the um, URB code. The three fifty is the URB code. Karen, could you clarify those? Yeah. So there are general design principles in the special, in the particularly in the table of use. So I sent you the right, link for the table of use for URB. You. So you all have that. Um, but there it goes through criteria generally for new construction and so um, the idea is that structures should um, generally be consistent with other structures on the you know in the block face but we also have minimum setback requirements so at a minimum you need to meet the 10 foot front setbacks um, but so but this then the, I'm sorry I'm sorry so um, the um, requirement, so the idea about having consistency with massing and setbacks and scale is that, um, you know, it allows for variety, but you don't want um, houses set all the way back so there's, you know, 100 feet and then it so effectively becomes a missing tooth on that block face because all the other houses are sort of closer. So it's still, it doesn't mean that everything has to be exact and that there can be variety. Mm -hmm but you don't want these extremes um, of variation um, along the street. So that is part of the URB table. So and then just also to the issue about which orientation mm -hmm. you're looking at in terms of your front setbacks, your sides, and your rears. This is a corner parcel. Um, so it has two front sides and one rear. It started, you know, so the primary structure is 236 South Street, so we look at the rear lot line as the most parallel to that um, front um, lot line. Um, and then the rest are, the, the remaining one would be a side setback, so the one parallel to Olive would be a side setback. Now, when DPW does addressing, they're, they like to, um, simplify things in terms of addressing where a driveway access point is. Mm -hmm. um, so their addressing may vary from what the zoning code says about corner parcels. Um, so it's not, I know that DPW had suggested that this maintain or it use the three Olive Street because it fits within the way, their framework of how they do addressing. Also, the major the major facade is now on Olive Street because it's quite a bit longer. So, wouldn't you say that that now becomes the front? And I think on the the plan, the Olive Street side doesn't look any longer than. No, there's more built. Oh, I see. You're saying because there's four well, right. corner I mean, units, two right. units. Yeah, it's about twenty five, thirty <coughs> longer. It's one unit longer, so it's bigger. Carolyn, but, I, I'm sorry, I'm still confused. The The language about consistency with adjacent houses is mandatory or just recommended or neither? Um, so um, it says, so in there, there's some general design um, principles um, for review of any projects, and it's not just special permit, but for any new construction. And it's, um, gosh, am I, um, <coughs> Um, so the, the specific language is that, um, you know, front doors should be oriented to face the street. Um, for new buildings, setback scale massing should fit within the block face. So it also says that any of these, so the, uh, that's, that's the language in um, criteria. So there are four sort of design principles for any new um, construction and so that's the third criteria um, and so it also stipulates that um, planning board may waive by site plan approval those the any of these elements um, and 
uh, but it's generally there as a, as a principle so that you don't have these extreme variations from one site to the next. And so you create, you're maintaining sort of a rhythm along, you know, um, a block or in this case maybe a corridor. Um, but it's really up for the to the board to make that determination. But that's, that's the general present to us. That is a wide variety of different. There is one with 17 feet off, right? On Excuse all. me, sir. There is one on property with 17 feet off. On Olive Street, further down. Yeah. So, but, so my point is, but not on is Main our, Street. My point is that is a wide a different setbacks. It's not right. the same for all the the, the houses. As you are describing, right? For the for the line along South Street, uh -huh. it is a continuous line that runs from where I live, two blocks away, all the way down, and then goes continues around the corner. This would be the only building, if it were to be built as this design shows. This is the only building that would be that close to uh, South Street, yeah. within well several blocks in one direction in, I don't know, a block or more in, in the other. So it would be very much out of the rhythm of that part of the street. So and I know we want to keep the public comment, but um, for the other board members, you've probably seen it, but on L3 of our plans, there's that zoning table that shows the setbacks that are in the code <coughs> um, and also what was the existing condition. And, uh, and Carolyn, I, m my question is, w these were revised? when the, the setbacks at some point uh, were revised in order to deal with some kind of issues, I would assume, right? In 2013, some of the setbacks in some of the districts were modified, um, particularly um, the front setbacks were pretty consistently revised because many structures throughout the city had front porches that were much closer than mm -hmm. Um, and, and buildings, and frankly, they were much closer to the sidewalks than um, than the zoning at that time yep. um, would allow. But that's not the case on this part of South Street, because all these houses are far much further back than this. And I think it's my contention as a property owner in that area that this really impinges on the streetscape. Thank you. Yeah. Other comments from the public? I don't know where to start. Um, I hey, guess I want to add again. No, no, sorry. One, one second, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so, it, it, does, does, in your experience, do you find? Is this is this difference a big deal in terms of how it's going to look at people? Yes. yes. I'm, yes. I'm not asking yes. you guys. I'm not seeing. Yeah. Can someone help me with where this goes down? Um, it depends on the so on the way a facade is broken up. So yeah. and um, you know I think the board had asked for the um, more. Uh, um, photo simulations. Photo simulations, but also to look at breaking up that facade, so they added some elements, you know, along the process. Yeah. So I think it really um, it depends on the exterior design, and I think it depends on the context of, you know, the, the neighborhood. This is also a corner lot, so there's more. There's a bigger gap, you know, when you cross that street, and there's different things happening on the other side of the street. Okay, I, I kind of don't know where to start because there start with your name and your address again. My name again. is Lee Meltzer. I live at 11 Olive Street. I am the abutter to the east of this property. I think I just want to. It feels like the explanation was lacking an acknowledgement that because of the size of this project, it requires a special permit. So that while it might be to the zoning code. There are additional criteria, I'm sure I don't need to tell you, you know this much better than I, that need to be met for a special permit. So if Ben were just choosing to build seven houses, all those things would be discretionary, it feels from my reading of the rules, to a different level than when he's building a project that requires a special permit. 
So I want to take a moment, although I know you've received it, I'm going to ask you to let me read the letter that our neighborhood composed that really tried to be very loyal, really taking out the subjective things that you asked us not to speak to, the speculative about the number of people or the number of cards, which we could not accurately predict, and stick to what is known and what is spelled out in the code that this board has created about URB and about special permit. And because it's my hope by reading it out loud that we'll actually hear it addressed this evening when you get to your discussion. So I'm going to start there. Um, I won't read the name of tonight's heat at hearing. The URB district has been described by the city of Northampton as primarily residential with single, two, and three family units allowed in different development patterns, including townhouse units. The URB district, the city of Northampton's design, in the URB district, the city of Northampton requires that for new buildings, setback scale and massing, this is quote, setback scale and massing should fit within the block face. Quote, front facades shall have setbacks consistent with other buildings within the block or provide a different setback that is necessary to address natural resources constraints. In the URB district, quote, any townhouse project creating seven or more units must ensure, quote again, sorry, safe and efficient flow of traffic within the surrounding neighborhood and mitigate increases in traffic on nearby streets. In addition, I'm gonna to go to the general special permit, which I made sure to check with Carolyn if that applied in URB2, and she said it did. The requested use protects adjoining premises against seriously detrimental uses, um, including provisions for preservation of views, light, and air. And for some of us, the views are really significant here, the change. The requested use will promote the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement on the site. I'm trying to skip words that don't matter. The requested use bears a uh, will not unduly impair the integrity of character of the district. So that's all quoting from the URB and the special permit code. Okay. I want to share as a neighborhood what we could collectively agree upon for, for not non-speculative reasons that this did not meet these criteria. Uh, the massing of 11 connected homes does not fit within the block face. You can't find anything like that. Uh, maybe you could sort of compare something way down the Smith housing and, and even that, the mat, it's sort of hot, it's tucked away. Uh, the 10 feet of setback does not match the block face. The elimination of the South Street curb cut redirects the entire burden of traffic from two lots to one narrow street, which will compound and not mitigate the increases in traffic. The design of the parking lot will require all service vehicles, including trash, snow, and delivery, as well as many or all visitor and overflow resident parkers to back up onto the street, jeopardizing the safety of the vehicular and pedestrian movement on a narrow street that's frequented by pedestrians seeking recreational opportunities in the meadows. By relocating almost all of the open space on this property to the interior of the development, the views of open space of neighbors and abutters and anyone driving down South Street have been severely compromised. It's all been moved to the interior of this large structure. All of these issues singly or combined impair the integrity of the character of our neighborhood. We understand, and I'm not gonna read to you everything that you're allowed to do in a special permit situation because I'm sure you know already, so I won't read all that. But, but because we now know that, I wanted to name five things that we wanted to ask or, or maybe there's four, okay. <laughs> Replace the 11 attached units with single, two, and three family units to preserve the character of the neighborhood. So make it match. Um, increase or redistribute the open space so that the views, light, and air are restored to the surrounding neighborhood and not just for the people who live in these units. Retain, not add, but retain the curb cut onto South Street for incoming one-way traffic and limit the Olive Street curb cut to outgoing one-way traffic. Redesign the parking to allow ample space for all vehicles to safely exit without having to back onto the street and create setbacks that match the surrounding properties. That one didn't make it into my final draft. I think I pulled it out because I wasn't sure. Um, and and we, we see this as not only vital to our neighborhood, but as a matter of precedent and whether we're gonna set a precedent that it's okay to knock down buildings and replace them with things that are out of character and out of scale and out of mass. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. I thank you for your patience here. The next thing that I want to do 
um, is to speak a little bit about um, some of the inattention to detail or carelessness that has been evident throughout this process, through every step of the way. When I spoke to Doug McDonald today, he said they never have had to turn in this many comments. This is the third time this has come before the planning board, and there is error after error, and it terrifies me to think that this might leave here with a full page about tree, tree protection, a full page about stormwater, and then it might go to staff level. And so I'm gonna say that, I'm gonna ask, as I point out some of the other errors that have not yet been addressed, I wanna implore you to leave this at the public level. And with the number of things that have been asked to be changed, to please continue this and not make a decision on condition that we no longer have access to, because every, things have been missed and it isn't fair um, to, to keep it, to, to, to take it out of the public prematurely. So, um, okay. First of all, you may remember that at the last two meetings, I watched this hearings, I mentioned at every meeting that two of my trees had been left off the plans. So in this third round, yes, two trees have been returned to the plans in the position of my raised bed. This is not where the trees are. They're not anywhere near there. And it actually matters because there's shade where they're proposing to plant tr a tree. Nothing grows in the shade of a maple tree, not to mention, I mean, I I'm sorry. I just, I don't mean to raise my voice. I'll, I'll lower my voice. Um, I won't start asking people they drink. OK. Um, OK, so the trees, yeah, that's not where they, so, so if you see at the top right-hand corner, that's where they, they, I don't know how they got missed by the surveyor. I don't know who came up with this creative location for my trees, but it isn't where they are. So I just, I just really need to state that really plainly. And in fact, that tree that's in that island is fully in the shade of my Norway maple. So it's just not realistic. I, I would add to that these aspirational solar panels on top of the carports, mm -hmm. that's fully shade. The reason I have a raised bed two feet from the street is that's the only sun that my property gets during most of the day. So I identify that as a careless error. Um, yeah, this, I guess I just want, I, I, I'm sorry I didn't have time to prepare as much as I did for the last two, but these solar panels, this is, um, this is full shade, and that's not where the trees are. Um, I want to talk about the difference between the tree that Jeff showed a very nice diagram of and my actual trees, because that was not a sugar, I, I feel pretty certain that must not have been a picture of a sugar maple tree. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that the roots of a sugar maple tree are right on the surface. So to talk about recommendations that were not just made by the city arborist, by the tree warden, sorry, but in the report that Berkshire Design said they called for the construction fencing. It didn't just get added yesterday by the tree warden. That was in your arbor that was in their report. Um, I forgot what I was gonna say. I, okay, I'll just keep going. Oh crap. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> I can't find my, um, I can't find my, I can't find my thumb drive. <laughs> that's not how that was supposed to, it wasn't a power, that's not oh, mine. Building the thumb drive again? Yeah, sorry, but I'll keep going. Here, I'll just turn to my notes. There you go. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, so their arborist, I'm sorry, again, I didn't have a chance to do layout, but their arborist specifically addressed the issue of the installation of the retaining wall and how that might impact the roots during the construction of the building and that the soil disturbance and the excavation would be potentially dangerous to my trees. And to hear the team say that, well, we just can't follow all those recommendations well then change the plans. Please change the plans and don't just decide that you can't meet the recommendations because they're too difficult in the way that you happen to have designed the plans right now. These are not immutable. What's immutable is the location of the roots of my trees. Um, I don't know why this is here. <laughs> 
Um, right, so this is what it's supposed to look like. Where's my, okay. Um, I think I'm just missing one of my pictures. So I'll just have to ex explain without all the nice curly cues that I had wanted to make. But I did want to, in discussing some of the careless mistakes, and the reason I'm bringing up these careless mistakes again is not to say that that's why you should deny a permit, people make mistakes, but to ask that the utmost accountability and public input be maintained through this project throughout so that I have the chance to keep looking, so that my neighbors have the chance to keep looking, and it isn't, uh, it, it, it is not behind closed doors. Um, okay, so I already talked about the trees. Um, it was pointed out by the tree warden when he came and looked at my trees that the place that was marked for snow, see that little thing that looks sort of like an eggplant in the bottom right-hand corner? It's sort of tucked into a corner. Yep. So that's where snow would go, but there's retaining walls like around it, like there's really no entrance into that. Um, another piece that's just really unusual for a site that is really committed to pedestrian and bicyclists is that there is no sidewalk. There's no sidewalk access all the way to Olive Street or to South Street from the back five properties or the bike path. So you have, or the bike lot, mm -hmm. the lane. No, the bike rack. The sidewalk stops when you get to that new small unit. It, it, then if you were looking at the planting, you would see there's a whole bunch of plantings to the right of that house. So the only way you can actually exit is to march through the parking lot, which does not really sound like, a, it, it, given that there's a criteria of pedestrian safety, I would not identify that as safe for pedestrians, that you have to march through the parking lot in order to get to Olive Street or South Street. There's no sidewalk. Okay. Just saying, that is clearly careless. Nobody thought that was a good design. Whoops, we missed it. Like, like to hear, to hear Mr. Squire say, like, we should, oh, well, it's to be expected that there'd be some mistakes where one page of the plans doesn't match the other on the third round. This makes me very nervous when I hear the level of maintenance and the level of care through the construction that this plan rests on that they have not earned our trust. And, and I just ask again that we keep it really open to the public and, okay, I'll stop repeating myself. What else did I want to say? Yeah, I just want to identify again that there is within the significant portions of my critical root zones are these blocks that require excavation. And that excavation, according to the tree warden, told me they'd need to be done like with, there should be like air spading and maybe if you cut them by hand, it would be okay. But this is excavating right on top of the picture of the roots that I just showed you. That is roots all the way at the surface and they're showing that they need to excavate a lot of inches. I don't know how many. I'm sure Jeff could tell us. Okay. Um, views. I know that Courtney, who lives next door, already posted a projected of her views. This is my view in the backyard. Um, when I looked at this, I like, I really started to cry. I thought, on top of all the issues with these carports, and I will say Doug McDonald literally said to me, sorry, the way these are designed, these will actually pour right onto your property. And I get there are different options, and I'm sure if the DPW finally approves them within this public format, and we see them again, they might be fine. But right now, not only are they designed to have ineffective solar panels and drop water on my property, but that's the entire length of my yard. That's what it looks like. And I just, I don't know how anyone could look at me in the eye and say, that's comparable, to, that's in any way comparable to the view that you have now. I'm not asking it to be exactly the same. In fact, it's pretty ugly. The backyard hasn't been mowed in like three months. I don't want it to look exactly the same, but I do not think it's fair to ask me to suddenly feel like I'm living next to a motel, right? That's not where I chose to live. Okay, uh, this is about those carports. Another issue that Terry Reynolds, who has been very alarmed by some of the stormwater calculations and who we did hire early on and since then has continued to just voluntarily call me with concerns that he has about these plans. Um, the retaining walls do not address the drainage from these island areas. So these, these planting areas, which may or may not be able to absorb water, but as we think about gutters and other places that snow might fall off and there's this big gap between the, my, ele my elevation and the elevation of this parking lot, all that liquid, all that, there, there is no 
accounting for that drainage and how it would keep off my property. Um, so I have a request based on this issue of some carelessness. Something that Doug McDonald said to me over and over is, once they solve the problems, this system should work, provided the soil is what they say it is. And he must have said that eight times to me. And I, I study Torah, and I know in the Torah, in the Bible, when something's repeated over and over, it's not an accident, it's to teach you something. And I am certain that he said that to me over and over to make sure I heard him. And so in the, um, in the notes, the copious notes, not just a few, as was referred to before, it said that the um, A, one soil test was never submitted. I understand those have been asked to be submitted. Um, that they, the, the soil testing be confirmed either during or prior to. This is from the language of the DPW note. So I would like to ask the planning board to ask that to happen before prior to and not during. Let's be sure this system is gonna work and that there wasn't an accidental typo when it came to passing in the notes about the soil testing and let's just make sure that this system is gonna work. They say it is even after all the kinks are worked out. So, so that's a, a prime concern for me that I wanna ask, I wish I brought water, and um, required updates called for, I don't know what that means. Oh, I think that was just what I was saying before. Please don't go to staff only. Okay, as an abutter, I have a few other requests that may not get heard. I mean, no one else is gonna say. Um, I would really like to ask you, please get rid of this hideous carport altogether. It's really, really unsightly and it's a terrible thing to live next to. I would like to ask that however, in whatever form this plan is ultimately approved, that rather than move the parking lot and not the fence, that the fence also be relocated to continue to be adjacent to the parking lot in the way it was in the original designs, and that plantings to serve as buffers for sight and sound be required on this, their property that is on my side of the fence. And I see that that listed in the special permit is something that you're allowed to do. And so I would <coughs> ask that that happen. And I would also ask that when this project does come to fruition, that we consider that this is a family neighborhood. And I know that 10 p.m. is allowed, it was my understanding, and ask that you limit the time for construction noise. Um, I'll just speak while I have those pictures of those two pretty little houses that are the next two houses on Olive Street, mine and Judy's. Um, and I just, just to sort of urge the caution um, that, that, that we not just dismiss these pages and pages of notes as something that could be met by conditions. Um, I want to express my concern that this is a project. Um, Ben is a first time developer. Um, the architect and builder, from what I could determine, doesn't have a lot of experience building something at this scale. I could be wrong, I, I did as much research as I could. The property management company that Ben told us he was gonna use has, has, was founded by recent college graduates in March, and when I spoke to them, they have, don't have a lot of properties yet. They don't have a lot of experience. None of these are bad things, but they're the reason I wanna ask you to err always on the side of caution and not just trust that everything's gonna go the way it's supposed to go. It feels like the only, the only really, really experienced players here are Berkshire Designs, and in certain aspects, it feels like they haven't totally lived up to their reputation here, that things have been a little more careless than we might expect. So um, I know I've been speaking for a long time, and you know I just want to say that I think it's an unfortunate, and I know that this is not the domain of the planning board. I think it's unfortunate that the, the, this didn't start from a place of trust between a developer and a neighborhood. That um, many there were it sounds like at least a year of conversations before anybody in the neighborhood uh, before we heard about this project. Um, ben didn't come to the neighborhood until the plans were rejected in August. When he came and spoke to us, there were very minimal changes. It felt like the main thing that happened was that he came to the next meeting and called us names and said that our observations were inaccurate. So it really didn't feel good. And so it, there isn't a feeling of trust right now. Um, and, and that's, um, that's not the character of our district, I guess is what I wanna say. I know that when you talk about character of the district, you might be talking about facades and setbacks and mass, 
And I would say South Street is a neighborhood. We have a knitting group. We have a block. We have block parties. Um, People take care of each other on our very active listserv, which is why in two days I could get 62 signatures on a letter. And people have been following that conversation all the way. We would really like to turn things around and get a fresh start. And let's say nobody's liking these plans, and let's start together in a spirit of collaboration where um, Ben could come to us in good faith, and we could speak to him in good faith and create something new that would work for everybody. So thank you for your, that's probably all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments from the public? Um, sure. Hi. Hi, my name is Kathy Peterson. I live at uh, 61 Olive Street, kind of all the way down at the other end of Olive Street. Um, to the <clears throat> point raised by Amy about the special permit requiring that the development meet the characteristics of the neighborhood, because again, you know, this is outside the normal zoning laws and therefore there's additional requirements specifically that it match in terms of the setback and the massing and the frontage that we've talked about to kind of help make that point with um, everything. I walked down the street the other day and just took pictures. It's a way to open all of these at once. It's gotta be, hold on, give me two seconds. Uh, hopefully let me scroll through. So this is just literally starting on Olive Street and walking down the street to show the various houses. And there is a wide variety of setbacks. There is a wide variety of frontage. But as you can see, they're all fairly small, discreet houses with big side yards. Um, there's nothing really comparable to what's being placed in in terms of the frontage and the massing. And this is literally just walking down Olive Street, walking down to Cherry Street, turning around, walking down to Fairview and back. And when you look at the different houses, again, as kind of Amy pointed out, that it doesn't really match anything that you're seeing just on a stroll down the street and back. Um, all these are kind of small houses with, you know, lots of green space. Again, the green space for the development is sort of centered where no one can see it, whereas pretty much all the yards have nice small gardens in front of them, have trees in front and they kind of add to the neighborhood and don't feel like a um, kind of almost walled off community. And I guess my concern is um, uh, those are houses that again doesn't really match the character of the neighborhood and will kind of fundamentally change the character of the neighborhood and then again the precedent that could set that the next developer could say well, now that there, there's this development you know there is something that massive with that kind of frontage and there can be more and more large developments placed in the area would over time change it because again if, if with the special permit wasn't required they could build whatever they want but given that it is a special permit we would like you to consider the criteria about the characteristic of the neighborhood. I just wanted to provide this evidence. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Additional comments from the public? Yes, go ahead. Actually, there's a little. <laughs> Sorry. Green sweater and then white sweater. Oh. <laughs> go ahead. Um, hi, my name is Barbara Sharp. I live at 56 Olive Street. <clears throat> um, actually, the first house that Kathy showed in her array was my house. Our house, my husband and, and my, my house. Um, our house was built in 1790. This guy, George Washington, was president when our house was built. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Look it up. Um, and, you know, we've lived all over the world, but we moved here 10 years ago, and we don't ever plan to leave. This is our home. We care a lot about it. And what's being proposed, some people have called it a fortress, some people have called it a monolith, some people have called it a monolithic fortress. <laughs> they all work from my, from my point of view. It is no way um, characteristic of our neighborhood. For that reason alone, I mean, there are six criteria in your own rules that have to be met. Every single one of them, every single one of those six criteria have to be met in order to grant a special permit. I'm saying 
it's not in character with the neighborhood. So that alone should rule it out. There's also a danger as far as traffic, the increased number of cars, the fact that there's only one access in and out via Olive Street, whereas now there are two via Olive and South Street. The house currently at 236 South Street is a four unit house, I believe. It has access and egress via South and Olive. What's being proposed is an 11 unit monolith with access, egress only via Olive. What happens on our little street, Olive Street, when there's no on-street parking because of snow removal. And the people at this proposed townhouse development have snow removal going on in their parking area. Where are they going to go? There's only a certain number of parking places legal on the street, on Olive Street. Parking is only allowed on one side. I can't imagine that everyone from this proposed monolith would be able to park on Olive without breaking the law if they have to move out of their own parking lot because of snow removal in their own lot. <clears throat> and I think. Um, Eric and Amy and Kathy have addressed pretty much all my other concerns very, very eloquently. And um, this is the third meeting that I've attended, and it's the first time I felt brave enough to speak, but I'm glad I did. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jessica LaFleur, and I'm at 244 South Street two doors down. I'm asking the planning board to deny the special permit that 236 South Street LLC has brought forth. It does not meet the criteria the planning board proposed to the public that would require the special permit to approve. I'm asking the planning board not to approve the project in concept. I also took pictures. I went 23 houses on both sides of me. Uh -huh. Not a single house has 35 bedrooms. Not a single house is built with three walls with all the green space inside. You look at every, and I went and took a little walk through all through. There is not, and now you put carports back there. All we see now is structure. I did take a picture of my backyard, and I don't know if you can help me set this up. <laughs> um, there was an article in the Gazette in May about an infill project over on Lake Street. The article writes that Mr. Fine, the Director of Planning and Sustainability, acknowledged concerns expressed about what infill changes would allow to be built. To address those concerns, the city adopted designs that covered massing and scale for non-single homes in relations to other properties in the neighborhood. We would like you to keep what you promised. We want it in scale. We can understand development. The house across the street added five new units with two bedrooms, 10 additional units. This changes what is currently in the pr main property. There's nine bedrooms. In the back, it's a small business. There might be one bedroom in there if they changed it. That's 10 to 11 bedrooms. This proposal, from my understanding, is what, 35 bedrooms? That is a large increase. So uh, let me see. From my backyard, uh, So the proposal puts, um, this is looking in my side yard towards the project, that back porch will come forward. You're going to notice that over here, you can't really see it well, but there's a shed. That wall is going to go from here all the way out to the second board in the shed. That's all I'm looking at is a straight wall. It passes Courtney's house on the front, and it goes from Courtney's house in the front all the way to almost to that window on that shed. That is too much for me to take in. Break, please break this up. There are two plots. Break it up into two buildings. Why are we going to take a building down in the front that we can just add to? 
We're going to throw that whole building in a landfill. This is about <laughs> sustainability. I understand the building in the back may not be able to be adjusted, but the building in the front can be added to, and from what I read in the past, I thought that's how that started in August, is adding to the building. That's what my understanding of sustainability was, taking a, process, a, a house and adding to it, adding housing. Um, the special permit process was created with respect to the visage of a neighborhood, which is defined as form and proportion. The proportion of this product does not fit with the neighborhood properties. The special permit process notes avoidance of adverse, adverse impact to neighboring properties. From my understanding, I believe the air conditionings are still on the front of the street. Um, Mr. Lewis doesn't want it in what he calls this oasis, but why are we going to take it? Why are we taking this in the street and in the green space inside that none of us see is beautiful? I would like this to be a working relationship between what was agreed upon on the special permit process and more closely in adherence to it. This dumpster, I can't see the dumpster. It doesn't matter that you enclose it. My concern with the dumpster is the smell. I don't, in this whole process, I have found some of the responses to getting things addressed um, or questions answered from the proposed builder don't get addressed. I don't want to have to call somebody about a dumpster. If the dumpster, were, you, can, you can take that um, uh, wooden building and put it in the courtyard. That way, if there's a problem with the smell, if there's an overfill, if there's animals, he's going to respond. That's his property, it's his rent. The neighbor should, shouldn't have, because he wants to keep that more marketable, the neighborhood shouldn't have to absorb that cost. Um, it's also a question on the site plan that the LSC has located a wooden fence on the property line, right on the line. How is the fence going to be maintained without trespassing on the abutters land? Um, so please deny this permit. This is not an infill project, but rather a redevelopment project. Please respect the visage of the neighborhood. Please do not set a precedent that is going to destroy the look of the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments from the public? Hi, my name is Keith Lapine, 11 Olive Street, a butter. Um, I'd like to be the first person to applaud Mr. Lewis and um, Berkshire Design for moving the parking lot. You know, we came here last time on our second attempt and we laid out some, some desires. You laid out some desires. He meant it minimally. He moved the parking lot, you know, the minimal amount, and, but I applaud him for that. And he lost one unit. Um, I'm not going to talk to Ben. I'm going to talk to you guys. Keep them moving in the right direction. You really were clear last time that you wanted this to be smaller and more manageable. That was clear. Keep them going. Um, my wife was really clear, like, you know, I don't know anything about storm water, but um, a lot of people do. And things aren't right right now. DPW still has paperwork out. You must deny this tonight while those things are not met. Um, there are rules, folks. We've been quoting, everybody here has been quoting the rules that you wrote. You must obey them. You can't waver over there. Um, these are your rules. No one man is above the law. Not our president, not Mr. Lewis. Um, you guys write the laws, you must obey them. And last, and, and that means DPW, that means the fence to protect our trees, everything. The rules must be followed. Lastly, I teach high school economics. I teach my students economics is the dismal science. It's not really a science. But the trees in my yard are 150 years old. They've survived droughts. They've survived infestation. If Mr. Lewis puts a parking lot over the roots and they die, I'm pretty sure that biology is not a dismal science. I'm pretty sure we could conclude that he killed my trees. And I'm assured enough that I'd be, I'd be really willing to take that before a jury of my peers in a civil case saying he killed my trees and that you guys allowed that. So if you want to risk that, um, let's go. Um, again, this is biology. This is not economics. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, just my, my drive. Oh.
Ma'am, are you planning on speaking? She is. Good. Judy Wish, 19 Olive Street. Um, oops, I saw. I just saw something that would be oh, helpful. Did you the well, no, but I'm looking. I just want to get the plans. The plans up, but I'll yeah. talk to it anyway. I. Uh, I'm just going to, just a little piece. I'm with everything that else was, that was said, but I want to point out another little piece of what I thought was carelessness. So we did hear from the developer that they've added a turnaround spot. So we've looked at that turnaround spot. Please take a look at that turnaround spot and tell me if you can turn around in it. Imagine yourself taking a car and going in there, and there's retaining walls, and then there's this locked-in uh, dumpster. dumpster. You can't turn. You get in. If you can get in, you can back out, and then maybe turn, but not if you have a large <coughs> vehicle. You're done. I just see that as another another piece of evidence of uh, the need for gr much greater thoughtfulness. And I uh, want to put my voice and my opinions on those that say that this needs to be redesigned. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Patrick Bowen of 95 Straw Avenue. I'm the founder of Yes in My Backyard, Pioneer Valley, a local group focused on balancing the conversation and housing debates that are generally dominated by abutters. Tonight I'm here asking you to approve the proposed plans for 236 South Street. A project like this is the fruition of decades long community undertaking to update the city's comprehensive plan around zoning and planning that started in 1999 with Vision 2020. This process included immense community outreach and resulted in a library of reports including Gross Smart Northampton, the Sustainable Northampton Report, and ultimately the major zoning overhaul in 2013 that established much smaller setbacks <coughs> to allow for denser construction. These efforts found support and enacted plans to address housing costs, sustainability, transportation, and traffic problems caused by workers living far from work. A key solution to these problems was to build denser housing close to downtown and Florence Center to decrease dependence on cars, as 70% of carbon emissions in Massachusetts come from buildings and transportation. The 236 South Street project fits with that community vision. This project complies with all of the city's zoning regulations, developed through extensive community process, and only requires a special permit because of the catch-all clause for projects of seven or more units. Denser housing close to downtown on a road with bike lanes. It has a great communal space rather than private yards. It has a mix of unit sizes that address different demands, including larger units. Currently, demand for these larger units is being met by buying a more modest existing larger unit and overhauling it, or a property manager doing similarly. Doing so meets demand, but removes affordable market rate units for families by converting those units to more expensive units. Me and my peers have seen this anecdotally. We can also see the effect in American community survey data from the last five years that shows rentals on the lower end and their tenants leaving the city. The number of families in rental housing, uh, the number of rental housing occupied by a family has gone down five percentage points in five years, which translates to about 185 family households. Additionally, median rents are up 15% in five years. If instead that demand is met by new units and this project increases the total number of units at the site, that will meet, uh, allow those existing market rate units might otherwise be converted and we'll have seen, seen in the data being converted to remain affordable. We need our housing stock to adapt to current demands, how people live now, and in harmony with a sustainable future. Our neighborhoods are not museums, they are com a community of homes for current and future generations. Thankfully, we as a community already outlined how to move forward over these past decades. This project is in line with those plans and should be approved. Thank you. Thank you.
If there are no other comments from the public, typically at this point the board will have discussion among itself. Um, sometimes we keep the public hearing open so that we can continue to potentially ask um, the applicant for clarification or um, have a, a discussion about some of the things that are coming up with us. Um, so as again, as this has been continued for several meetings, we've not really moved into that phase yet where the board has had discussion um, you know, among itself. So I think we'd like to be able to do that, but we will keep the public hearing open um, so that we can continue to, to reach out. But um, we would ask if, if you do have a comment you'd like to make now that is pertinent to our discussion, you know, this would be a good time to make it. Um, but I think you know, we have heard a number of things that um, give us a lot to talk about amongst ourselves as we sort of sift through, um, you know, the, the criteria for the project and for the permit. Um, and so I think that's that's where we are. Um, Carolyn, I need to use the restroom. Can I do that? Yeah, just take a break. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, if, if we can, uh, I'm sick and I need to use the restroom. And can we take a five-minute break if, you know, if everybody doesn't mind that? <laughs> that would be great. Don't we have to vote? Do we have to vote? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Do we? Yes. Oh, OK. You can take a motion to, motion to pause for five minutes. Second motion. Oh, come on. Second. All second. <laughs> <Please, please. All laughs> <laughs> OK. So as I said, we are going to keep the public hearing open, but move into a board discussion phase. Um, we may ask some clarifying questions. You may have some additional clarifying questions. Um, but based on what we've heard, we now have an opportunity to talk amongst ourselves and get some guidance from staff about um, some of the concerns that have been raised, our own interpretations of the special permit criteria, um, and where the project is now that it has been revised a number of times. Um, so are there specific comments from the board? Would somebody like to start off? Or I can start by reading some of the recommendations from staff. George, you look like you're about no, to. No, 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 please. I think before it gets to recommendations, I think a, a discussion is or, in order. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll, I'll start. I, I think in, in general, I don't have an issue in general. I don't have an issue with this project. I don't have an issue with infill. I think we had specific requirements kind of laid out that the applicant came back and addressed whether it was shifting the parking lot and they reduced a unit and the garbage enclosure and the bike racks and so forth. Um, so I think a good faith effort has been made to address most of the issues in general. Um, but the biggest issue that hasn't been addressed, that's always been an issue of mine, is, is the, the mass, you know, the, the setback, the scale, the mass. And mm -hmm. it, re it reminds me of a, a project we did in Florence at the beginning of the year, um, I forget the name of the street, where there, there was a larger, the, the, the zoning allowed for a building in the back. Yeah. Right. And it came in front of us and the setbacks were met. Right. Everything was met. It, it could be done by special permit. It was allowed, but that doesn't mean we need to approve it. Mm -hmm. And the mass was just wrong. It just didn't fit. It wasn't in character with the street, <coughs> the neighborhood. Uh, it just didn't work. And so uh, we rejected it, sent it back, and it, it was redone and brought back in front of us to something that was more agreeable mm -hmm. with, the, with the houses around it. And I think we're headed in the right direction here. And I, I think, again, the applicant has made um, a lot of adjustments. And, and, and he was very meticulous with the last time with, before I go, tell me what I need to do. And I think he's, he's at least attempted to meet all of those uh, issues that were brought up other than the massing. I, don't, I think, and you can't get away with it uh, from the massing if you don't if you don't change the massing. You know, if, if it's one continuous wraparound building from south to olive, it, it just doesn't reflect, the, to me, it doesn't reflect the character of the neighborhood. And it's not in, in keeping with the requirements of the special permit. Other folks? I would agree with that. Touch? Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think infill is a wonderful thing. I think the applicant is um, made some effort to comply with the issues that were raised. I think, however, that it does not satisfy the requirements of the zoning ordinance. Um, looking at the special permit criteria for seven units or more, it says projects creating seven or more units in one or more phases within a five-year period shall comply with the following. 
doesn't say it's recommended, it's to, for their consideration, it just says shall comply. Number four says the front setback is consistent with the surrounding neighborhood and other buildings within the block. I just don't see how we can conclude that it satisfies that requirement. Um, even from, I mean, from the information provided by one of the neighbors, and also, George, thank you for pointing out the table on page L3, the layout plan, even by the applicant's own statistics. It's, if we look at the front setback um, and compare what is on South Street and Olive Street in existing conditions, to uh, the proposal, it doesn't even come close to meeting them. So I think whether we like it or not, it fails to comply with that requirement. Then if we look at the special permit criteria generally in the zoning ordinance, not just applying to seven or more, there it says before granting an application for a special permit, the special permit granting authority, that's us, must find, must find, um, again, absolutely required to find all of the following criteria are met. Number three says the requested use will promote a harmonious relationship of structures and open spaces to the natural landscape and existing buildings. I just don't see how we can possibly conclude that this application satisfies that requirement. It goes on and refers to unduly impairing the integrity or character of the district. That's, in my mind, a little bit vaguer, but I don't think it satisfies that either. Um, I, I agree with what Mark said, the massing, the, it's like an impenetrable wall that will be built in the neighborhood on both streets. Um, I, I think if it were reduced to eight units, maybe nine units at the most, so they, they could be separated into separate buildings, so it wouldn't have that feeling of an impenetrable wall, uh, an assault on the neighborhood, then I could support it. Um, but I think as submitted, it fails to satisfy the requirements. In addition, if the board should see fit to approve it, which hopefully it will not, I think that it should be required that they plant more trees on South Street. The existing small trees that the city has planted are inadequate to the task of softening the image of the buildings. And there should be, they should have to plant very substantial trees. And second, I think the carports should be eliminated. I think if we look at page, the, the Olive Street view, the color one, which shows the view going up Olive Street, the, the, the neighbor that uh, uh, spoke about this was accurate. It looks like all you see driving up Olive Street or living on Olive Street are the roofs of those carports. Um, and if they were removed, then at least there would be a, some distance between the neighborhood and the buildings, but those carports um, make it worse. But primarily my opinion is that it does not satisfy the absolute requirements of the ordinance, so I'm opposed to it. Uh, I, think, yeah, I think for me there are two main things here. And, uh, and right in the beginning I wrote, are the carports needed? That was <coughs> when you guys start to talk about. Uh, and the other question is about the setback, right? That's not clear to me. Um, I, I live in the neighborhood, not that close, and I walk my dog. And today, I decided to go a little further down to see. Um, and I walk all the way, all the street, all the way down. I saw the house, the setbacks, right? Uh, went around, look from the brick multi-star building. I think that lady, probably she lives in there. Um, one thing I cannot agree with her is that it's quite far, you cannot smell any. That's the thing I cannot agree with her. 
the, the dumpster. It's quite far. There is a property in between. So, um, and uh, quite frankly, the whole mess thing, I personally do not have a problem with that. Um, but I do have this issue now about the carport because I walk when I was walking back in, in Hill Street, um, Olive Street, and then I thought, well, maybe the carports do not belong in there. But um, in the setback, um, the fact that there is a variety of setbacks because you don't, you have to consider not just Olive Street but South Street, and quite frankly, when I look from a distance, like this, this, this rendering here, I try to visualize it, the building. Oh, that was one thing, my thing. It has to be that color, <laughs> because when I look at it, when I see the colors, the whole thing, that was the thing that I thought, well, hmm. But the size, quite frankly, with all due respect, does not, it's not an issue for me. But all these other points, the setback, the carport, the kind of stuff, that's my. George. So um, we, we had three big concerns. I think the massing, for one, fitting in with the neighborhood, mm -hmm. the, uh, the traffic patterns. I don't have an issue at all with um, eliminating the traffic, the traffic on South Street. It does cause a conflict. If it's there's driveway in and out right next to Olive Street, I think we should keep to that. Um, the parking lot, I think they've made some great adjustments there. Um, I appreciate the comment from the public about that turnaround space. It is in a very awkward spot and not practical, really. So if there's a way that the, the developer could look at some way to accommodate cars coming in and turning, I think that would be helpful rather than where it's positioned. The massing one is a much more difficult one. Um, and I know at our previous meeting, we had a little discussion about breaking up the buildings and giving a little pedestrian access or an airway in between some of the buildings. And at that point, I didn't think that made a lot of sense. Um, but I do think, you know, I've, I've, I've come to the conclusion, much like um, Mark, that if we, if there's a way to separate this into perhaps three buildings, but still accommodate eight to ten units, I think that would be great. I think I, there's a really, as the, the last public speaker spoke about the need for, for, uh, for housing and a variety of housing, I, there's a huge need in Northampton. We've all got to kind of buy into that. I think part of my role, our role on the planning board is to try to help implement and uh, interpret our our guidelines, our zoning guidelines, in order to accommodate different kinds of housing. And we're not always going to meet what when it's integrated into a neighborhood or when it's put into a neighborhood. Um, so I'd hate to see us reduce these units by a lot, um, just because Northampton's in a place where we need uh, a, a good variety of rental housing. You know, I like the idea of the carports because it makes the it makes it a little bit more attractive. There's not a place here for garages. Most of the houses in that neighborhood have probably separate garages or attached garages where they can put their cars. It's an enviable kind of thing when you rent something. So um, I don't know if there it's a, a negative impact as much as looking at a parking lot full of cars right next to you too. So. Um, but I think that's a lesser kind of concern than the massing. So I guess I would um, put myself on the side of asking the, the developer to come back with another set of plans that allowed for a breakup of this one large building mass. And because uh, it's, it's just a little bit too much for that stretch of South Street and Olive Street. But. Sam, thoughts? Well, I, um, I guess to me it, it, it doesn't, it's very much out of context of the, of the neighborhood. And, and it's not the size that bothers me because, I mean, honestly, like, for example, the, the brick house to, as you go to, towards mm -hmm. East Hampton, it's pretty monstrous, large, yeah. in a nice way. <laughs> um, but uh, to me, it's about the fact that it's just, 
not open. It seems like a um, it seems like a, a gated community within 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 a very open neighborhood, and um, you know, um, and that's a problem. So I mean, it sh it should be smaller. I just I think that we are having more housing is a good thing. Having nicer housing in this town is is a, is a very good thing. Um, but I I'm just um, I question if putting this many units on this small a spot is what would have passed. I, I wasn't actually here when when they passed it, but. I, I don't, I have to imagine that a bunch of city councilors or whoever who voted on it would not have voted on this if people thought that this was going to be built next to them. Because, I mean, we all, we all have to step away and say, well, you know, some small things can be built next to us and we have to be okay with that. I mean, no one is happy when, when a project is built next to them. But this is, this is huge. And this is, in my mind, uh, sort of violates the spirit of the law. It's interesting. I, it's too bad that we didn't get to this point in the discussion at the last meeting, because I think that tonight we need to be extremely explicit about what we would be comfortable with here. Um, and I think you know, it, it is, I can't recall exactly what happened between the first set of plans and the second when it started out as multiple units and then became connected because it was yeah. interesting, you know, that the very first set of plans had issues certainly with, you know, the parking and, and tree protection. There were a number of other things, but that they were separated was sort of the thing that, that made it feel more viable, you know, that it was numerous buildings as opposed to, you know, this particular building. I think, you know, the number of units, you know, we've, we've all sort of thrown out numbers and stuff, but I do think that we need to get pretty explicit about what would be yeah. appropriate for this site. I, I don't think I agree with that, actually, because um, I don't think it's our place to tell the developer what to bring to us. I think all we can do is vote on what he's submitted. It's up to him to decide what he thinks might get approved next time. Okay. Can they actually, Caroline? Well, we, question. Can, can they some, just can, in the if the applicant, I mean, if this application is turned down, um, and that remains to be seen, but could they just turn around and submit another one? Um, sir, as long as there's a substantial change, they can submit it any time. Okay. If it's exactly the same plan, right. they can't do it for yeah. two years. That would be a waste of time. Yeah. Right. But I do, right. I do agree um, with what Tess is saying. You should be either way. If you deny the permit, you need to be very specific about why you're denying it. And if you want a continuation, you should be very specific. And I also agree with what you're saying. You shouldn't specify what the number of units are. I think of your concept are because, you know, units can change. You could right. have 11 units but with smaller footprints and then mm -hmm. have, you know, five-foot break between blocks to have pedestrian access, and you could still have the same number of units. So I think, but I think being specific about carports don't work because you don't have the, you can't deal with the snow um, right. or the drainage in the way that it's really intended to be dealt with. That makes sense, but I think you all should come together and say, okay, I can live with it as long as it was broken up in one location or two locations right. or, you know, whatever. And I don't want carports and, and the setbacks, you know. Mm -hmm. Alan, you suggested that it doesn't meet the setbacks. Well, there is a variety, there are a variety of setbacks. So is it an average? Is it a little bit, you know, do, is that what you want them to show, what the average is? There is a minimum setback. So there's, you know, I think there's an issue here where the zoning does say you can have a 10-foot setback. Right. And if you had a three-family um, or a two-family that we didn't require a site plan, yeah. you wouldn't right. see it at all. And right. it would be right at that setback. Right. 
Um, but that's, and if, it could if, be, if this was a site plan review and it met 10 foot setback, right, we would we have to. About it. Right. But the special permit allows us to have right. this discussion. The special right. permit, I think, requires that we have the right. discussion. Right. 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 right, but I, I think I, I would be careful in saying it has to be exactly a setback yeah, of the neighbor or the other side because there is a variety and you have right. to look at the bigger yeah. context as opposed to just the sure that, that it's a we corner can design lot. their project. I'm not suggesting that. Right. I'm just saying you're saying the setback's wrong, and the applicant got the direction from the zoning that says there's a 10-foot setback. So if you feel like in this context 10 feet is too close, then I think it behooves you to get, I mean, if they're going to come back, they need to know Wanted to what be you feel is yeah. appropriate in terms that, of meeting that special wrong. permit criteria. So, so let me right. just correct something. Uh, when I said it is setback, uh, I just want to clarify that. Because in that way, I have no problem with that either. With the short setback? Yeah, the short, as it is. Yes. And so, another yeah. thing is that I was not here when the first, this whole thing mm -hmm. started, so I have no idea, right? But uh, again, just to disclose, my own problem really is a catwalk. So, go ahead. I say that um, a group of us met together, and one thing that was very clear is not one single person said we shouldn't have this project. Seriously, nobody. And um, we did feel that, as some people said, that it could be broken up. It would feel much more um, like part of our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And also, many of the buildings uh, in that area are fairly small. Um, and we, we don't feel that, um, I mean, we discussed numbers, and it seems a little arbitrary, but we all felt comfortable with eight, which is about twice the number of units that are there right now. Um, we also felt they shouldn't be too big. Open up. And that's, that's all. I, I mean, if you were looking for some specifics, that's what uh, the group came up with. Amy, did you want to, is that? No, about? we issued a letter with things we felt were keeping with the special that's, permit. That's, that's that all I, I wanted to say. draw from as you create the guidelines mm -hmm. and pull them from your code, so. Yes. So can, I, can I ask? The we're going to have a developer. What, I, I'm looking at this picture right, right here. Uh, Whatever page that is. What number, Sam? You know? A900. And for me, and again, for me, again, the, the size is, it's just about the fact that it doesn't seem open to the, the neighborhood. And I'm just wondering, and mass is an issue, you know, but if you just got rid of this corner, this one corner lot, I, I know that that's getting rid of a, a source of income, but would that, I mean, you you know this you know this project much better. Would that open this up? Would this open this up and give us that sort of the walkthrough that I think a lot of us want, but at the same time allowing you to have as many properties as possible? Could we? Yeah, please, if you don't mind, just we'll take an answer and then we'll get back to you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So that was exactly what we looked at, and I remember actually at our uh, the last meeting, Mr. You, Mr. Taylor had asked, "Well, is it going to be one unit or two units that you might drop?" Um, because at that point, it was it was in concept phase, um, and so we did look at that. We looked at what it would look like if we had these two units and then three units here, mm -hmm. with with nothing, sort mm -hmm. of on this knuckle piece, um, and what it looked like to me was that it was. A row of houses and a row of houses, and what what I asked our architect to do was to really dress up that corner piece and really beautify that corner. And so, um, I'm sorry that I don't have our original designs, but our original designs sort of met at a corner like this. Mm -hmm. And then what I asked uh, our architect John is here to do was to sort of take that point and really give it give it some Northampton flair. And so that was what we did. That unit is now smaller than what it had been. It has architectural details that it, that I believe, help to make it part of the neighborhood. Um, so yes, it is a possibility. I'm oh, sorry. And the other, this area over here, where I'm waving between where the, can you see where? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So where the large units connect to the small units. Yeah, yeah. Originally, that was a breezeway. Got it. Right. Um, yeah. But when we shifted the parking lot over in order to accommodate that, we, we closed that because that breezeway never really made sense. Mm -hmm. 
it was a very small, and if you can imagine as you're coming around, a very small peak, and you, you didn't actually even get courtyard views. You just saw the side of the small unit. And um, in talking with lots of people, friends and other people who, who I would consider potential future residents of a project like this, they said, if we don't, we don't need access from this sidewalk to this unit. If we're going out, we can walk out through this way and go out this way. And for many of these units, we can go straight out from our, from our internal unit. So um, I, I'm, I hope that the fact that we showed up tonight with 11 units wasn't, isn't seen as a disregard about your comment about massing. In fact, that knuckle piece was specifically designed to accommodate and the maintaining a unit, shrinking that one, mm -hmm. but then also beautifying that corner and bringing in some architectural elements to the neighborhood. Um, I think that if you look at it like this, it feels like, wow, that, that fills the lot, or it certainly fills the front of the lot. Just to sort of take you back, the iterative steps were we had originally looked to have buildings this way and to maintain green space in the front. We had thought about pulling the buildings a little bit off south and a little bit off olive, but then that was going to reduce the internal interior courtyard. So with regards, what, what we were trying to do was maintain, you mentioned the spirit, the spirit of the law and also to main, uh, the rules, excuse me, I should say, um, but also to, to provide the best future experience for the residents who are going to be there. I, I am sensitive to the feel of the neighborhood about not wanting not wanting them to feel like this is a monolith that is you know dropped in the middle of their neighborhood mm -hmm. i i don't feel like it's dropped in the middle of their neighborhood i feel like this structure fits with a lot of what is on south street within let's say a three or four block range um this folks thanks Go ahead. This is this is now on on two different uh, accommodating two current lots. Mm -hmm. So we have one, two, three, four, three and a half units on Olive for what had previously been, you know, one house and one smaller unit, and then one two and a half units on South Street for what had previously been one large single family house. So, with respect to the the desires of trying to provide additional housing in support of infill. We, I, 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 I brought the comments that you gave to me last time to our team. Yeah. We thought hard and diligently about it, and I feel like what we tried to do was to, to present something that um, was respectful of that and... and uh, yeah, and I don't think, I think at the last meeting, I don't think that we were particularly, I don't think that we were as explicit as, as what we're hearing tonight. <clears throat> you know, I think that we had some different, different attendance over the several meetings that you've been here, but... Um, but yeah, I think I, I don't. For me personally, I don't feel like this was like a disrespectful plan. You know, I, I think we didn't really say last time too much. It's got to be three buildings. It can only be eight units. You know, we we didn't say that last time. Um, and if that's the direction that we're headed, I think you know, again, without putting a number on it, I think we we do need to be explicit. One of one of our challenges too is uh, we need to be able to make this work from from a business perspective. Of course. As well. uh, and so. Dropping that unit was hard, but we needed to make it work because otherwise we couldn't accommodate the, the parking lot in the way that the parking lot needed to be accommodated. Right. Um, so, you know, we were willing to, to work on that. We don't have a whole lot of movement left. Okay. Yeah. Ma'am, you've been waiting. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Brunell, 279 South Street. Um, I don't have anything prepared. I've just been sitting here and listening, and I have been on the email list with uh, Amy and the gang over there. Um, only two comments, and it's really to pick up on, I don't know who you are. Oh, Mr. Chen, your, your comment about the spirit behind the <coughs> rule. Um, it has felt, and I've been here a couple of planning meetings, that there are minimum requirements, right? But it feels like this plan pushes against the minimum. It tries to maximize profit in a space that fits the letter of the law, but doesn't necessarily fit the spirit of infill in concert with the existing neighborhood. There are much larger buildings further down South Street toward town. Pleasant Street, right, is now full of very large complexes, but they fit in the neighborhood because that's the way the, down, the real downtown sits. But our section of South Street is not like that, at least not yet. Now, maybe someday it will get there, but 
this so far <coughs> away from all of the other larger buildings does feel very like it dropped from the sky. Um, and it is monolithic, it is not broken up, it doesn't have open space, all the other things that were said. So just, you know, really holding to that spirit behind the rule where it isn't necessarily to maximize everything from zero to 100 when this thing is built leads to a, a pretty tough precedent, which can then be hot leverage. The other thing I really want to go back to is sort of the tree protection. There are rules around that as well, and, and guidance from arborists and guidance from the, you know, tree committee and the warden. But those rules that are in place have also been adhered to when other items have been built in town and the trees still die. So the oak tree at the Academy of Music, I drive by it every day and it, it will not be there much longer because it is having dieback and that's only progressing if time goes on since those parking lots were built you know, at the Academy. And I, I had hoped when that was done that that beautiful, probably 120, 140 year old tree would be there for a good long time, but I doubt that that is really true. So I would ask that we be incredibly conservative to protect our trees, our shade trees. They are valuable. We cannot replace them in our lifetime, if ever, with climate change. So to protect them requires a little extra effort, I think, on our part, even though the letter of the law doesn't require it. Because when you make a mistake, there is no compensation for that. There is no recourse. It's just gone. So on behalf of Amy and also the rest of the neighborhood, I would just ask that that be a consideration when you think about it. Thank you. Go ahead, Alan. Well, I'll, I don't feel really comfortable designing the, the plan for the applicant, but I'll give it a shot just to, <laughs> to further the discussion. Uh, I suggest they, would, they come back with a project of no more than eight units divided into three separate buildings with space between them. There be no carports and although I may be the only one that's mentioned this, <laughs> that there be big trees in front of the building on South Street because there's plenty of area there to do it. So but nothing about moving the setback off from South Street. That can stay. Well, good point. There <coughs> should be. We've been talking about that all the time. I, I, th I think it should have a bigger setback on both streets but I don't know what that number is. Yeah, I, I would like to, instead of giving a number, right. just give direction. I, I think right. in solving the massing problem, there might be an opportunity to, at the same time to address the setback issue uh, because you have more room yeah, to move. Fewer units. Right. So and so, and with that, if it's eight units or nine units, whatever it is, whatever I think. It turns out to be. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not hung up on a number. I'm. I'm I'm hung up on the massing and the setback and the scale and the character of the neighborhood. But, but I think it should be separate buildings. Right? Yes, I think that's to, to address the massing. I think you need it has to be separate. So yeah. you think two um, buildings? So you're saying two blocks or three? I'm saying blocks. three. Right. I, and just for two context, separations. Sure. Create mm -hmm. three right. blocks. And that could be a pedestrian separation. Um, I just, for context, you all approved a special permit for eight units on a, a little less than half an acre across the street. It was one long mm -hmm. extension. It had just the minimum parking requirement. So the other tension here the is parking. the additional parking spaces right. above what the zoning requires, um, right. and which could be eliminated to provide right. more or less, you know, parking area because they don't need to provide those. Right. Um, this site is about three quarters of an acre, so it's a, about a quarter of an acre more than the eight unit that was approved across the street, just for context. Right. Right. Um, but uh, yeah. uh, so I just, you know, think about that. Um, that was existing buildings, right? Well, they added on. That's they an added on. Yeah, it's different. Right. Yeah. That place? Yeah. 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 That, yeah. yeah. The orientation was, this is unique because it's a corner lot. Right. So. Yeah, but I, right. I was interested when I was yeah. walking today. Mm -hmm. And I was almost across the, the project they're proposing. It's not yeah. too far across the street. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I thought, what the heck is going on here? Why these people can and the other one cannot? I mean, I questioned that. Mm -hmm. Why they were, we approved that and uh, now we're having this. 
Well, one of the reasons, just to talk to that, is they, they maintained the existing home and they added on to the back. They didn't take down the existing structure. That's going to stay there and it looks pretty much like the other ones on the street. Or is this just going to be a tear down with a brand new structure and a much larger and mass that we'll see? Visibility right? on two, right. the other, two the sides. New, six units or five units behind the Betch building, we won't really see that from the road as much. I think that's the big difference. And the parking? Well, the parking. Well, yeah, I mean, that's something we should talk about. Sir, do you have one extra comment? Yeah, I just want um, to make two clarifications. Number one is about the setback on Olive Street, or South Street. Olive Street, yeah, it's variable. South Street, if I could pull up Google Maps right now, you could draw a solid red line. 40 something feet back, all the way for blocks. Mm -hmm. And then there's Mr. Lewis's place, that's 15 feet off. It's striking, so let's be clear about that. The, the setback from, from South Street, it is clear. The second thing I'd like to bring up is, you, we, Thank you. we talk about number of units, and you're referring, this gentleman's referring to the number of units across the street. Those are two bedroom units. Okay, he's building four bedroom units. We're talking about units. We really need to talk about number of bedrooms. And he has twice as many. He brought up data last time about how he wasn't over the line compared to other developments. And he, he talked about the one across the street. Those are two bedroom units, eight two bedroom units. He's proposing four bedroom units. That's apples and oranges, folks. That's his. His are double units. So we have to keep that in mind. Well, again, I just about I think that our guidance from staff, and I think it's good guidance, is that we not be prescriptive about the specific number of units. I just want to be clear about no. I don't. I'm not talking about number of units. Again, I don't care about number of units. Let's talk about right. number of bedrooms, because that's that's what's going to bring the people in. That's going to be the the issue here. So right. But I think. I mean, I don't think we can, we can't discriminate against number of bedrooms either. Yeah. We can't say, you know, it has yeah, to I'm be. I'm just pointing out, out right. again, we are Family comparing so apples yeah. and oranges by comparing it to the one across the street. And I, George and then Sam. So I, I'd just like to talk about the setback issue yeah. again. <clears throat> it's an old neighborhood. It's been around for a long time. That's the way houses were built then. Northampton's evolving. We've got to evolve. Um, so there are going to be changes Thank in you. my lifetime, but certainly in the future generations where houses are built with these kinds of setbacks on the front streets, and it's not going to happen just downtown or in very dense neighborhoods. It's right. going to happen in neighborhoods like South Street. There's going to be changes to the setbacks. They can't all be cookie cutter right. like this, and neighborhoods have to accept that. I think that's a good point, but this is a radical. Sure, change. yeah, sure. And that's right. Is, I guess there's two things. One, this is also an entrance into Northampton. Yeah. You know, like when you enter into the, it, like, I mean, for example, I remember the first time I came into Northampton to visit my mother, I was blown away by how unattractive it was when I got off of exit 18. Um, <laughs> so that very unattractive, you know. And then, but it, you come into, from East Hampton, it's, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, an important thing to maintain. That, not that this is not, I'm, right. you know. Well, which is interesting because as a corner lot, I mean, this could very well be a very notable yeah. parcel, yeah. you know, or a notable lot for yeah. an interesting, yeah. you I, know. I also don't have a problem with the car, I don't have a problem with the, the carports myself, but I, I you know, Maybe, maybe, I think they're probably I, causing an service that would be yeah. Yeah. <laughs> maybe ditch them. I mean, I think you should think of the carports not just as the structures and whether or not the structures yeah. are appropriate, but what's going to happen with the snow load. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. It was, and, which I can yeah, and the stormwater and yeah. But I mean, and just to go to parking again as well, you know, I mean, I have said this at numerous meetings, I, I think that the less pavement we have, you know, the less time we're paving for cars, the better. And, you know, I, I think they have gone above and beyond, but the, pro the other project on South Street was right at that minimum requirement. And we were okay with that because it was a, it was a fine infill project. I mean, there, there wasn't a he problem. Extra we, spaces. We I didn't. That that hearing, he had extra spaces. He had more than the minimum requirement. I, I'd be happy back at that. There's no turn around. I thanked him at the end of the, I was the only one who spoke. And yeah. I thanked him for going above the minimum requirement. Spots. It wasn't a lot over, but yeah. like two over 
what was required. So well, I stand corrected. I know we certainly have approved projects yes, where people sure. have met the minimum, yes. um, and I am 100% always comfortable only requiring the minimum. I do not think that we need to be kind of paving over parts of our, our parcels that, you know, when people need housing, um, and we are this close to downtown. Um, so, you know, if we were to say to the developer that we want to see, you know, three separate structures, um, you know, I, I don't feel strongly at all saying that we would need to require, you know, visitor parking and, you know, obviously there needs to be a handicapped spot, but, you know, I think there should be some flexibility and, you know, that there's a reason we have the parking minimum and there's mechanisms in place for people to address illegal parking, street parking, you know, we've heard that in the last one. So do you have another comment? Well, I do. I just wanted to help bring the conversation back to where it's at least my first comment, which was as we talk about setbacks and people's opinions that it was really great to hear the the musts of the special permit and that if we want to see the South Street neighborhood change in terms of setbacks, the way to accomplish that would be to do projects a little bit smaller so it would happen. I mean, that's my understanding. If you were only building three or four houses, you would help slowly affect that change because you would not require a special permit and you would go to the minimum. So it seems to me that this is a safety net to say we don't want to go too quickly in that direction so that when there's seven properties or more, they do need to, they, they must be sensitive to the setback. And that helps that change happen, but at a reasonable pace, right? Because if it's a smaller property, it's allowed. If it's a larger property, it's not allowed. So I, I really appreciate just that it isn't about how we feel about setbacks, right? It's there's it's it's a must. It's a have to. That's what we call the ground. It's a have to, not a get to from my reading of the special permit. I could be very wrong. Well I I, I actually wanted I think that's something we want, but again if they were to go to seven properties or six. Or six, they could build it. 10 feet yeah. away and exactly. we couldn't well it's not exactly that's the point the point is that uh that they could do what they do they, they could do what they're they going right? yeah right there, there we go right so but they'd have half the number of units yeah, they would but i think we just need to be comfortable knowing that you know what what we suggest we're comfortable with may result in no project at all. I mean, that's definitely a possibility. Um, obviously, we're not we're not developers. We're not required to you know make sure that that all projects happen. But you know, the balance is knowing that when we make a recommendation to the developer of, of something that we would feel more comfortable with, it's possible that that may not be viable. Um, and so that's in terms of providing housing units throughout the city and various types of housing units and meeting the city goals. It's just something we need to be able to keep in mind. Well, yeah, I, I'm going to say, because I, you know, again, I'm not their consultant, but as of right now, I would, I would vote no. But if somehow this, and maybe mass is not the issue, if it was just more, if, I, if it felt more open to me, I would vote yes, because I, there are lots of properties on that street that have lots of lots of units on them. Mm -hmm. There's a ton, of, and you know I would I not one to get in the way of someone making money. I think it's it's none of my business, but I do feel like if you could fi figure out a way to make it feel more open to the people passing by on South Street, I would I would definitely vote yes. Are, are we talking straw vote? I mean, are we going to vote on this? Or well, what's that's the process? A, I mean, I think, you know, what we've heard is that we could either, if we were to just outright deny this particular application, you know, we'd need to be explicit about why, and we've heard some of the statements already. Um, or we could, my understanding is we could continue the hearing with more explicit guidance with the hope that we would get to a fruitful project given specific guidance that we provide. We're still in public comment, so I would ask right. if the applicant is open to a continuation right. and, and, and addressing these issues, and then we don't need to vote, we just continue again. The, the other thing is they're sitting here listening to everything right. that's been said, obviously. Right. So um, 
I mean, they should be able to figure out how to submit a project that will get approved without our telling them how many units and how many feet and how many. Uh, yeah, no, Alan, I hear what you're saying, but I mean, there, there is a balance. We, we can't just say, find me a rock. We can't say, I don't like this, bring me back something and I might like it. I mean, we, we, at a certain point, we have to be somewhat explicit about what direction we're leaning. And so that's, I think, uh, again, Taylor, we're not suggesting number of units. Go ahead. Sorry, Mr. Taylor, can I ask you a question? If, yes. Um, so this, this knuckle unit, the middle unit at the corner, if we were to take that unit out, just as a for instance, yep. it would allow light in, it would allow people to walk into the neighborhood, uh, mm -hmm. to, the, to the development. But it, I don't think that it is additive. I think that it allows light in, but I don't think that it makes the project better. And I want to be respectful to the opinions and feelings that it, it feels too big. It's a corner lot, and one of the things that I did after the last meeting was drive around town and try and find the best looking buildings on corner lots, mm -hmm. and that's what we did. And so um, we, this project could not go with eight units. This project probably couldn't even go with 10 units. Um, the cost of development is expensive now and is only getting more expensive, as I know you know. Um, and with that said, um, we worked really hard to try and hear what, what we heard, uh, to respond to what we heard last time, <coughs> and not to make a change to break this building right here or to separate it right here, just to do it. We felt like there was more harmony on that corner when the buildings were united, and that when you were walking by South Street right here, is this my slideshow? Is this our slideshow? Mm -hmm. Sorry. So from, th from this perspective, to me what it looks like is, wow, this is something that was actually designed to fit on a corner. When you're looking right here, you can see the, the full length from South Street past Miss Hill's house through to the Meltzer Lepine, uh, Lepine family's trees back there. So there are sight lines. There is, there is an entrance here with a fence, uh, a gated fence, so that we have egress for our, for our future residents. You can't even, you, even from this perspective, as you're coming further down the street, if we separated those buildings, you wouldn't even be able to see it. You would barely be able to see it. And so that, I, I feel like um, we've really tried to hear what you were saying and, and plug that in. Um, there are a lot of limitations with this site. We pushed it to the max specifically because in our estimation, that's what Northampton wanted when they were talking about infill. Not fill it up a little bit more than what it is right now, not just add two accessory units onto the back. The current building that is at 236 South Street is more than 150 years old and is falling apart, which is the whole reason why this project started, because it's a beautiful lot in a beautiful neighborhood with lots of people who love living there. The whole reason why we did this on this corner is because everyone loves living in this neighborhood. And so this is an effort to bring more people to this neighborhood so that they can enjoy these pieces of the neighborhood. I, I, I fully support that, but I think as designed, setbacks, setback, scale, and massing, those don't reflect this beautiful neighborhood that you want to, uh, you want to develop. And so, and I think there's an opportunity to, if, if you reduce the massing, the scale, that would allow to address the setback concerns. And I, I think the, the discussion, the, the knee-jerk reactions have, have been, at its core, a response to that, that this, it's a beautiful lot, it's a beautiful design for a corner lot in a bubble. But this isn't in a bubble. It's on Olive Street and South, and it doesn't fit Olive Street and South. And I, I'm not sure that also that the board has said that it's the corner unit that has to go. Yeah. I think it's just that was. I'm sorry. The, that was purely yeah. the, the mass. So even so, if you had a pedestrian, a five foot wide break on the South Street facade and a five. Like right in here Olive or something Street. like that. Yeah. yeah, and then also on the Olive Street. I, yeah, I, I so would think I, I would be. Five, oh, I'm sorry. I would be open to something like a breezeway, like a pass through. It, 
that when when you're designing a townhouse, you know, part of part of why units like this are designed is because you're able to share certain costs when you have shared walls. And so, you know, that that was done again with intention, not in a sloppy manner, <coughs> not because we're trying to keep the neighbors out, but because in our estimation, that was the best way to for this parcel to be viewed vis-a-vis -vis the neighborhood, not not in isolation. And so, uh, you know, uh, uh, if we if we broke, you know, for instance, break making a break here, you know, let's say we took two feet from one unit and two feet from another unit, and there's a four foot or an eight foot or whatever we're talking about passway. Again, I would be that's something that I think I would be willing to do. I'm just not sure that it makes it better, and so um, that's where I'm having a little bit of this tug and whatever the expression is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Just to yeah. make clear, my yeah. own personal individual opinion <clears throat> is that two feet or four feet would probably make it worse um, because it make it look like an alley. Uh, it's got to be big enough to break up the mass, and that I don't know what that will take, but uh, it and it probably will take reducing the number of units and having a bigger setback. And if that does makes it not feasible financially, that's unfortunate, but it might happen. Are, are you locked into, you mentioned three units. Are you locked into three units if they can do it with two? Well, that, that gives, I'm thinking, a break on South Street and Olive Street, which then leaves three blocks of building. I mean, we, we had even, if it's okay to respond, we had looked at having a block of two or three buildings here, and then a breakway here, and then two or three buildings here, and then a breakway here, and then these buildings here, which are all hidden from the street. No one seems to have an issue with them anyway. But <laughs> yeah. well, um, if I will say honestly, if you feel that that makes the project better, I will be happy for us to go back to our architect to, to, to review that, to see how we can design that, how we can trim a little space to do that. It, it feels like we're, what's the expression, biting our hands to spite our face. How, we're trying to provide more units into Northampton yeah. at, 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 in, in a better way so that potentially more development can come into town. And then I'm just not, I'm having a hard time juggling those two things. Yeah. Your burden is not to solve the housing problem in Northampton. It's to build something here that will be consistent with the neighborhood. Well, but our, I, mean, I think well, he has that objective. And that's yeah, our burden is to kind of look in the future and say yeah. this is a precedent well, yeah. to allow yeah. things like this to, in order to augment the housing But stock. still yeah. something that will be harmonious with the existing neighborhood. Right. Go ahead. Okay, I just, people keep asking what this project needs, and I would like to say very plainly that what this project needs is a really excellent architect yeah. with a great knowledge of design. It's not your job to solve the design problem, it's the architect's problem to solve, a de this is, design is hard, right? Like, I don't have to tell you that, but there are design issues. We've named the issues, and the reason there isn't one clear recommendation is that there are multiple ways to solve the problems that this project has. For example, setbacks and massing together create a lot of problems. Like, a lot of times a smaller building like, it's a combination of factors. And I think it's, rather than say we are stuck with this specific design and what can we cut and slightly move, it's like, here's a parcel of land and it needs a really good designer and then there could be something amazing and beautiful that everyone would love. And it's unfortunate that a, that a lot has been invested into a particular design that then we're trying to tweak when in fact the answer might be about a different design. So that again, it just, it's the elephant in the room to me. I have one other so sorry. Yes, go ahead, ma'am. I'm, I'm Nancy Kay at 206 South Street. I live across basically from Lathrop Home. Mm -hmm. And if you, Lathrop Home is a large building, but it, its arms welcome the street and that that would feel appropriate. Uh, we, I'm sorry, we also looked at that, yeah. but we were asked to hide parking. We were asked to, right. you know, yeah. there, are, there are a lot of conflicting desires here from lots of different stakeholders, and we, we've really been trying try to be respectful of that. Um, uh, can I just ask a quick question, which yes. literally just came to me? Yes. That, the, the knuckle unit, this, I'm sorry, this corner unit, instead of it being a unit on that first floor 
If that was an archway, which allowed a walking path from that corner street into the middle of the neighborhood, uh, into the middle of the development, is is that something that that you feel would be in in a, addressing the spirit of what you're what you're looking to do? Uh, I, you know, we, yeah. we looked at, at putting, separating these buildings. We looked at having, I appreciate what Amy suggested. We already did that. I mean, you, this is not the first drawing that we came right. to. We looked at putting things here and putting things here and having the parking in the middle. We looked at par putting, we, we looked at all those different permutations. And our desire the whole time, unabashedly so, was to get as many units onto this lot as possible because that's what we believed it needed. And, and that's what we would believe Northampton needs. And, um, so I, I'm open to I'm open to tweaks that I feel address something. If you feel like you you need just a light view into the courtyard, if that would ma would make a big difference, right. that's something that I feel like we would be willing to do. And if it means then that that unit that this unit isn't a first floor unit and only has a second floor, and we're able to figure that out in some way, um, that that's something that I think that we we could do. But um, we are not in a position for us to be able yeah. to. I mean, I think that that would, that would probably work for some of us, but I think the majority of folks here, from what I'm hearing folks say, I think for the majority of folks, that wouldn't be sufficient. And so I think there is a bigger. Yeah, I just want to clarify. My opinion is that what we don't, what we're not saying, at least I'm not saying that people need to see into the right. middle of the development and they don't need to be able to walk into it. Nobody who lives in the neighborhood is probably going to have any desire to walk into the center of the development. It's just to deal with the sense of an impenetrable wall of, of too big and over, overwhelming a building. It's not to walk into the courtyard that you've created and you know, sit on the bench. Hi, I'm Jessica Liffler from 244 South again. I don't understand something. There are rules created for this special permit. There are rules. Wayne Fieden said it. This is to make a neighborhood feel that they're going to get somewhere protected. Start the plan with starting with the rules first. Right. What's the average setback on each side? What size of a building would match that neighborhood? That's where the architecture should start, with the rules. Right. I appreciate your comment. I do just want to say that there is, um, these are, rules but they are discretionary i mean everybody can interpret character in different ways and so i think that that's where this isn't as black and white as checking things off a box the way that that a zoning requirement is that that's why we people have different interpretations of massing of scale um as george said of <coughs> evolution of communities of how how big that circle is you know, when there are folks who are kind of weighing in from way down on South Street or way up on South Street, you know, so it isn't, um, we're very familiar with, you know, with what's written in the bylaws, but there is some amount of interpretation. And that's, I think, what, what people are kind of expressing here and trying to figure out. But the interpretation is, as they stated, that's where the smaller homes start the interpretation, not a massive project. You set such a big precedent to let something this large break so many rules. Right. The massive Well, I think setbacks. it's clear that we are not approving this plan as presented. But so the setbacks is an important item. Yeah. And I feel like we're trying to say, hey, cut a couple holes in that. I just actually want to thank you, uh, Mr. Lewis, right? Um, because I think what you said was exactly where the disconnect is. You explicitly stated what your goal was, right? Your goal was to push the limits of the infill spirit or law, right? The neighborhood is on the, not the complete opposite side, but if you're over here and zero is here, we're kind of at like 40, 50%, right? We're not trying to say nothing. We're just not trying to say maximize every plot opportunity to maximize infill. <coughs> so somewhere in the middle, there's got to be a balance. And I feel like your, your goal was laudable right you're trying to follow something that this town city says that it wants ultimately we're starting here and trying to move toward that over time so <coughs> what i think we're trying to all work out is where is that compromise where is that middle ground that works for you to have a viable 
opportunity and for the neighborhood to not feel like it's been infiltrated by an alien spaceship from you know, <coughs> God from the sky. So I think we, we're all starting from different places and yours is very honest and ours is very honest and it's how do we get to that point in the middle which is where you guys come in, right? To try and say we have a bunch of competing interests and nobody is saying we don't want it. We're just saying how do we fit a design that maybe isn't this design into a place where we want to increase the infill, but not necessarily maximize it day one so it doesn't fit our part of town. So that's. Thank you. Can I ask one more Sam. question? Um, I'm just trying to, I mean, if we're designing, because it's. What page are you on? Uh, 8904. What if, could you turn the U so that the shape, so that the U shapes are on South Street? And you do your sort of archway, and the archway is, you know, so in other words, you park back here and you walk from the parking lot through the archway into the. Does that make sense? I didn't catch it. I'm sorry. Okay, I did get that. A mirror image of what? So an, a mirror image of what Just you flip, have. Flip the ute towards right. south. Yeah. So would that would that work? And then you know you have your archway. I mean, keep the parking lot there so that you don't see the parking lot. I I. Oh, so you're saying just like moving, moving the, moving moving this unit moving, to here. Yeah, to right. there. Or to here. Yeah, you know. So you have you know, and then your archway that you were talking about. You walk through your archway into, courtyard, and and the yeah. courtyard, and it's going to make it feel. Like if I was if I was thinking about this, the 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 U shape, you know, you you make your you make the two end units sort of attractive facing facing South Street, and it's going to feel, I would think, like you're you, it would feel like you are separating things without actually doing it. I think that may be a good idea. It may not be. I don't have any idea. But I don't think we should be designed. I think it's time right. to either <laughs> vote it up or down. Yes. And well, it, I'll do either. I mean, I mean, I I feel like I would have liked for us to get to the place where we were saying something that was a viable continuation, you know, rather than just an outright denial. It it doesn't sound like we're quite there. I mean, it sounds like if we were to say that we want to see at least two buildings if not three buildings and we want to see a setback that's at least you know at least half of the average of you know south street you know so that would from the curb that would be the 30 feet or so but you know if we were to say that it sounds as if that is not a viable option um, for the developer that you know it wouldn't behoove we us to continue solve that problem right but i'm saying it's the difference between administratively between continuing the hearing with guidance expecting something to come back and just outright denying it well they uh, can still come back even with a denial file a new application true uh, it's true. basically all of the i think carolyn isn't all the only difference whether they pay a new filing fee um, yes, I mean, they have to resubmit. Because um, they have to resubmit all new plans either no. way. Right, but they don't, wouldn't have to necessarily resubmit the stormwater permits and uh, oh. um, the other information. So can we everything would have to be duplicated. Can we take another? I'd like public? to make a motion that we, that we postpone this meeting till the next, the next, uh, you have two permit hearings, uh, November 29th and December 13th. Well, they're going to need more time. Well, we also, but I mean, we can't, con again, like, we can't continue it unless we're giving viable yeah. suggestions. Well, I think we, we are. Bunch. We just gave them a bunch of viable information. Yeah. So at least two, if not three separate buildings and a setback that's increased to at least. I just think, yeah, I think. And, and at least I, some of us, th oh, sorry. No, I, I don't know that we need to be that specific. I think yeah. if, you, if you look at the the criteria in the special permit about massing, setback, and scale, that the that the revisions made need to better reflect that wording. Because right now, the way I read the special permit requirements, this doesn't meet that. And so if whether that's 15 feet or 18 feet or 22 and a half feet from South Street, if it's more and, and we're flipping the U like Sam suggested, uh, and that better reflects that wording, then I'd be okay with it. And if that means 
two buildings or three yeah. or one building flipped upside down. I don't really care. <laughs> right. And there's also a lot of concern, obviously, about the carports. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Let's maybe then one other thing is just to, to sort say. of guidance on parking, you know. Yeah. What? If you would, um, you know, the extra parking, right. is that necessary to your approval? Can we take one last public comment and then we'll mm -hmm. close public hearing and then we'll, oh, or we'll yeah, continuing, of yeah. course. Yeah, so let's take one and then we'll articulate our desires. Yeah. Go ahead. I just wanted to speak again based on the discussion that's happening so far with the board. So I have concerns of how the discussion is going that there's been a lot of talk about precedent tonight, but how we have in the code very objective criteria on numbers of how far things need to be for setbacks or building heights. And then there is some, I think Carolyn used the phrase of guiding like principles that are subjective and open to, to interpretation. And I think the focus of the code is on the objective numbers because we're trying the goal of the zoning overhaul was to give developers clear guidance so that they could plan projects that would fit the criteria of what the city they said they want said they wanted which was to one bring a lot of the city that was out of conformance into conformance and also to meet multiple multiple goals of the city along preparing for climate change uh, having more people close to downtown to support transportation businesses uh, less in car travel and uh, to meet how people want to live. And we're getting into like a feelings and how we would prefer the building to be designed. So not just for this project, but for projects going forward. If we're getting into, well, we actually would like it to be spun the other way or elevated in such a way or broken up that needs to be specified in the code and that's not really on the planning board to write that code in this setting so it would more accurately to rewrite the code in this setting it's the goal of the planning board to decide whether it meets the code as written and as passed by council and not to do like a supreme court like move i had heard or somebody say like was it really the intent of the councilors at the time for this project to come forward we're not and trying to interpret what was in their hearts, we're interpreting what they put on the page and passed, and that this project meets those objective criteria. And that your role as the city is to speak for or to deliberate for all the people who are not here as well as the group that is here. <coughs> Should not have a group of a very small group from the city override that much longer, much bigger, uh, I'm talking about like 20 years of deliberation that came to the planning rules that you have in front of you today, should not be overridden and re-deliberated at a meeting with the people who are most opposed to a particular project. Thank you. Thank you. Sam, did you make a motion? I did make a motion. I second it. Thank you. Can you say your motion again, I, please, I, 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 for the rest of us who didn't hear it at all? <laughs> Now you have to remember. <laughs> <laughs> I motion uh, that we uh, continue this continue this meeting uh, at well, Carolyn. Give me a date. Um, <laughs> well, uh, there's December 13th, or then going into January. I think December. What, can we ask the developers six weeks enough time for them to do what they? It, it feels a bit of an, uh, I, I, it feels like an undue burden. And every time that I go back to Berkshire Design and to this one where, and to the architects, I, I don't mean to make this a, a, a money thing, but there's thousands of dollars that are being poured out regularly with seemingly no end to the faucet because of the lack of clarity and I felt like we had clarity at the last meeting, and I felt like we attended to it. And and I, 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 I do respect that you don't feel like we are quite there yet. Um, but it, just to say, even let's slice this building, let's do this. It may look easy on that map right there, but there's all sorts of calculations, all sorts of time that goes into that. And it's not, it, I don't know how we can continue with the project. 
All right. What, I move to close to reject the proposal as is. Well, you'd have to close Second. public comment first. Oh, I vote to close public comment. Wait, you have to first withdraw yeah. your motion. I, I vote to with withdraw my And with I withdraw my second. Thank you. I vote to reject this proposal. I to vote to close public, public comment. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. I vote to reject. All those in favor of closing public comment? Anyone opposed? No, actually. I, I vote to reject this proposal as it is. Second. All those in favor of a denial of the application for a special permit and a, or excuse me, a site, site plan review and special permit to demolish existing office building at 236 South Street, 3 Olive Street, MAP ID 38B245 and 246. All those in favor of denial? Discuss it first. Yeah. Oh, we just, could dis yeah, mm -hmm. we could discuss it. Sorry. Yeah, just so I understand the ramifications. Yeah. If it does not, pa if the if if you vote to approve this plan, if there's enough votes for that, then we'll have an opportunity to to define and refine once again the conditions. Yes. Moving forward, yeah. right? Because that's a little bit murky at this point. Okay. Right. So we could vote to continue the hearing, and see if there are you know requested changes. We could vote to approve it with conditions. We could vote to approve it with no okay. conditions or to deny it. Okay. I'm, I'm uncomfortable. I, 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 I don't approve of the plan that's been presented tonight, but I'm uncomfortable in just flat out rejecting it and, and stopping this process without continuing it because that seems punitive because then they'd have to start all over and the, and the, the costs which the applicant discussed are real. Right. Um, and we're only making it worse by having them start everything over. But, but, but they probably I, wouldn't. I mean, there's a possibility I, I just, of not right, starting right. over. I, I asked, I thought what I was doing when I asked for it to be delayed was to give them that chance. And I was literally just said, that's going to cost too much. That's not an option. So I said, mm -hmm. guess what? Let's move on with our lives and get this done and reject it. Because yeah. I gave that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I tried to give an additional month or six weeks, and I was rejected. So I will say that we have given a huge amount of time, a lot of recommendations, and that's not good enough. So we need to reject it. I mean, I think to be fair, uh, yeah, yeah, I think to be fair, we've focused yeah. almost exclusively on hearing public comment. We didn't get to the yeah. point of having board discussion where we were saying specifically, where all of us who were here, you know, were, were being explicit about the massing issue. I, I mean, I'm with you, I don't have a problem with the massing, but that's, you know, that's not five of us. And so I, I don't think that we've been consistent about what some of the issues were because we've been because we have continued the hearing and had a lot of public comment and, so, and, and you know I, I'm afraid about it. I have to agree with him with the developer saying that it was not that clear last meeting that the massive was a huge thing right. that turning point it was not yeah. how well, so just to <clears throat> anyway the, so. I mean, I, I personally would do either one. I, I mean, if the developer wants a continuance, I personally am happy voting to continue it, but we should do something. Right. That's I yes. think what I was saying. I right. gave that opportunity, and that wasn't what you wanted, so I voted to say to reject it. And you can easily reject I'm not my, my feelings won't be hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can reject my reje my rejection, <laughs> which doesn't necessarily get us any closure. But George, do you have a recommendation? No, okay. well, I just want to again clarify what what is our voting parameters here? Our quorum and it's a special permit. Are all seven of us voting? Yes, yes. Yep. and we would require for approval. We would need five. Well, for any and, any, for any, any vote, vote, you need, we would five. need five. Right. So does the developer want a continuance or no? We've closed oh, public hearing. Sorry. Yeah. Oops. Yes. Don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> Wink. <laughs> um, it's funny for him. I, I think, I, yeah, I think he said that that he likely wouldn't be able to to reduce the massing and increase the setback. I mean, it, that's what it sounded like he said. Well. So we're we're at an impasse in in having to deny what is in front of us if it if there aren't 
if we can't achieve, you know, five yeses with conditions, then yeah. See, we I'm would not, deny it. I have no problem with the mass. My problem was the carport and the considerations that was made by the abutting neighbor with the trees. Uh, again, I walk on that south street. I look through on perspective from a distance. I just don't see. Try to visualize the corner building. I didn't see a massive golden coat, right? Uh, I think the developer made a point that he worked around in trying to make things fit on it. Um, so I just would approve with conditions. That's my point. That's how I approach to this. I think we've all s said it. I mean, my view is we can't, the conditions, <clears throat> I, I, I mean, I'm going to vote against it unless there's so many conditions that I'd have to be an architect to include them all. Um, so I'm prepared to vote. Well, why don't, if you were to make a motion uh, to I'll, approve. There's a motion on the table. Yeah, there is, a, oh yeah, there is a motion. <clears throat> take a vote. Feel ready to take a vote? And the motion is, your motion is to deny? Well, I can, I can start with. Approve, and Ooh. yes. I already have a motion. No. It's already on the table. All those in favor of denying the application for 236 South Street, map ID 38B, 245 and 246. So two votes to deny. All those opposed to denial. So five opposed to denial. Okay. So where does that leave us? So you can have another motion. Um, so, you know, you've closed public hearing. Um, you could have a motion. You, um, let's see. Motion to continue. You can't. You've already closed it. So um, you could have a motion to um, approve with conditions. That doesn't mean you have to sit here and do conditions now because you have um, um, you have a certain amount of time. Um, we're meeting within that amount of time that you could um, come up with conditions. So you would just close the hearing. You have to do. You can do conditions later. You don't have to do it on the same night. Is what I'm saying. So. If that were the vote that you wanted to make, that you wanted to just um, keep it as a closed hearing and come back in two weeks um, to make a decision, you could do that. And that doesn't Actually, it doesn't yeah. sound like we would be and reach any consensus at that point in two weeks. Yeah, no, no. just not tonight. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you, I mean, right? I mean, it would take. You know, well, can I ask the people that? voted against the motion, what do they want to do? Well, see, uh, now it seems our options are limited. So we're yeah. continuing it. There's, we're not going to continue it with, um, we can't find consensus among us with, as far as the guidance. Um, we're not, I'm, I'm not in any position to approve it with a 10 page list of conditions. Yeah. Um, and we close the public hearing, right. which means just not for tonight, but for any continuing. Right. Right. So can we reopen? That's that? something. I don't know that we can well, we reopen it. Um, you know, you've you've voted on it. You've already voted on a motion. I think um, technically, it's well, probably well, not. We made a motion to rescind it. <laughs> That would we be a first. A motion to, that I guess, reopen it. Um, and then we could continue the hearing. As, as long as nobody's <laughs> left <laughs> the room. Um, I make a motion to reopen this discussion on uh, 12 townhouse units on 236 South Street slash Olive Street, Northampton, map ID 38B 2245 and 246. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of reopening the public hearing? Yeah, I guess. Those opposed? I'm sorry, folks. George, do you have a vote? Yeah, right. I'm, I'm in favor of it. Okay. Though I'm not sure what that's going to get us at this point. Well, I think now Great. we can continue it. Now we can, and, right. And, and if the applicant is willing, we can at least have the discussion if the 
public comment is open. If the applicant is willing for the continuation, we continue. If it's not, then we can close and reject. I mean, the other thing right. you can do is just continue it, and if the applicant opts not to come back with any changes, then you can make your decision right. at that point. Yeah. Right. That's it. Do you want to make that yeah. motion? Yes, I make a motion <laughs> to... Uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm been, I've been very successful. The hot seat tonight, <laughs> Sam. <laughs> I make a motion uh, that we continue uh, to December 13th. 18th. December 13th discussion for the construction of 12 townhouse units on 236 South Street slash Olive Street, Northampton, 11. MAP ID 38. B 245 and 246. 7 7.30? 7.30. Is there a second? Second. Mark? Those in favor of continuing to December 13th at 7.30? I guess. Right. Anyone opposed? We are still open. All right. I hope that there is an opportunity for a resubmittal that is more in line with scale passing and character. You say the last part again, which is more in line with uh, scale, scale massing and setback. setback. Sorry. No test. That's okay. You know, we uh, we move through some things kind of quickly out of tiredness or something that we probably shouldn't have. So, you know, it's not your fault. Uh, folks, we do have some other business, so if you are going to be chit-chatting among yourselves, we ask you to do that quietly while we do our other business that's on our agenda. Thank you. We have other business. Uh, we have ANRs and minutes. Oh. Singular. Sure. This is an ANR on Spring Street. Um, there's a non conforming parcel. Thank you. I know it's late. Thank you. By Thank you. another lot. Um, and this uh, lot owner with the bigger lot wants to, well, wants to give land to the smaller land. So it's not, they're not creating any new lots. It's just a land swap to make a smaller lot bigger. Sorry, I missed the uh, Spring Street. Spring Street. Yeah. ANR Cook. Yes. Is, is so it's just this little, like, 2,000 square feet of rectangle in the back is owned by this property owner. It's going to sell it or give it to. So no new and will development that parcel. Lead to development, or is that just going to lead to a back to No, I think it's just probably adding to the yard because it's smaller, as I guess. It's not going to be. It's already. The, both parcels have houses. Okay. okay motion to approve? Yep. Tag all those in favor? Aye. <laughs> I got two hands over there. Okay. We, have, we have minutes? We have minutes? We have minutes. Um, no, but there is a request for an extension of the time limit to hold a public hearing, issue a decision, and all the other requirements under um, um, Chapter 40 um, of the Zoning Act. Um, and this is for a project um, on Bird's Pit, Ryan Road, that was submitted, but they're not quite ready. And they don't, they, it might be several months before they come back. So they've asked for an extension. They've signed an extension, but we just officially need the board to sign it because it's a mutual decision to extend it for 90 days so that the time clock runs out in March instead of December. They may come back and ask for another extension if they're not quite ready in March, but. Um, this is just um, to allow the process not to be, con the permit not to be constructively granted because nobody's ready for it yet. So wow. need to vote for that to extend the time period. Is there a downside? I mean, is there a downside for the city? Um, no. So under 40A, I guess I should have explained that. You, if someone submits an application to the planning board, the planning board is obligated to hold a public hearing within 65 days, or the applicant can go to the city clerk and say, I want my permit, because planning board didn't hold the permit. Oh. So that's the downside, okay. is you don't want to construct an automatic, grant. yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, in this case, they're not ready, and, and typically, even if you know one party thinks they're ready, the other party doesn't, we negotiate for them to um, allow for this extension. Um, so, yeah, yeah it's, it's in everybody's best interest in this 
scenario um, to do that? This has a little background. This is a solar facility that's linked to the marijuana facility. It's not linked, no. but it's on the same um, overall. It's it's actually on the abutting parcel, but owned by the same um, property owner currently. And the other property, other property owned by that owner, you guys approved the yeah the marijuana production. Well, Motion to approve the extension. Approve. Second Second. by Yuri. First. All those in favor? <laughs> Anyone opposed? Great. Can I sign this? Yes. Great. Carolyn, do we need to find you an intern to help with minutes? <laughs> help with minutes. <laughs> wow. <Is there> <laughs> minutes? <laughs> I would love to have someone else do minutes. <laughs> you would. Sam, is there another motion you'd like to I'm, make? I have a motion to. I have a motion. Motion. To. Second. <laughs> Go home. Adjourn that one? Yes. That's Alan it. seconds. All those in favor? Anyone opposed?